Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host, John DeLynn. It is August 16th, 2022, and we are in an epic, amazing, um, multi-part Mormon Stories Podcast series with father-son duo, Evan Smith and Weston Smith. Hey, guys, welcome back. Thanks, John. Thanks for having us. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and we're here with... Uh, my dear friend and colleague, Gerardo Sumano, as producer of this episode and running shotgun. Hey, Gerardo. Hey, John. Welcome back. Thanks. How was lunch? It was great. Yeah. Yeah. Gerardo likes McDoubles, for those of you who don't know. Um, no anyway. pickles, no onions. <laughs> yeah. Weston likes milkshakes. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, anyway, we had a quick lunch because I'm trying to be a more humane human to my colleagues and, and guests. And uh, we're right back ready. We just spent a good three hours uh, with Evan and, um, Weston Smith talking about what it was like, uh, for Evan and, uh, for Evan to become a progressive Mormon branch president and ultimately Bishop within the Mormon church. Yep. Uh, we talked about his upbringing in the Mormon church, him marrying Cheryl, Cheryl. Yeah. And, uh, and then, and then him becoming a big time global corporate lawyer in <laughs> Boston, uh, helping with entrepreneurs and startups and that sort of thing while fighting some very serious, um, physical conditions that included yeah. brain tumors. Well, should I, we, should we jump in and let you Yeah, we'll a, finish. I, it, it fortunately wasn't actually cancer. It wasn't a brain tumor. And I, uh, through years of going down to NIH, I'm now on a drug that is perfect for me. It gives me that protein that I'm genetically missing to have a break on my immune system. So I'm, I'm really lucky to have the treatment that I have and I'm doing great. So your brain doesn't keep growing growths that it shouldn't it, grow. It doesn't have the immune cells attacking <laughs> infections that are not there anymore. That's what was happening. I had stuff yeah. that it was attacking stuff that wasn't there. And now that's regulated. I'm, I'm doing great. Beautiful. Yeah. Really lucky. So where we left off, uh, in last episode in part one, and if you haven't watched part one, pause now, go back, watch the previous episode, listen to it. You'll be super glad you did. There's a lot of really important context there, but we talked about how, um, Evan reached, uh, a position that few Mormons reach, which is the level of Bishop or congregation leader within the Mormon church. And not only did he start having an LGBTQ uh, affirming awakening when a member of his branch or ward came out to him as gay, but uh, within a short amount of time after that, his own son, Weston, came out to him as gay when Weston was 16. 16. Is that right? And uh, that's where we left off in the cliffhanger. So now we're in part two, and this is, this is a time for Weston's story. And I'm just going to go ahead and take a minute to plug Weston's book. Weston, along with his dad, is also a published author, self-published author. This is a memoir called This Body of Water. If you have um, a family member, young person, it's probably for adults too, who wants to read a memoir about what it's like to be gay within a high-demand religion or within Mormonism. That's what this book is about. It's probably for uh, other people people in or coming out of other high demand religions as well. Anything you want to say about this book before we jump into your story? Yeah, it's definitely a more mature book because I really wanted to convey kind of the, uh, the harsh truth of, of, of what I went through, which was involves a lot of suicidality and, and things like that. So, um, it's really a book for anyone, you know, any, I invite any church leader to read it, um, just so they can have a better understanding. Any church leader, any parent, anyone who wants to have a better understanding of what it's like to really, you know, struggle with being gay um, in, in the church um, or really any type of queer in the church. Um, you know, I, I was really honest with my feelings and and I'm very proud of what I've written. And so um, if you want to check it out, it's available at westonsmithbooks.com uh, for purchase. It's Weston um, with an O. Yes. So yeah. westonsmithbooks.com. Um, all one word and yeah. Westonsmithbooks.com. Dot com. Yep. All right. And I don't know if you guys know this, but half of our audience, half of our viewing audience now has never been LDS. So we have a lot of members of other high demand religious traditions who I think are going to be able to find value in this book as well. Yeah, for sure. I think I hope really so. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. So what we're going to do is rewind in our Back to the Future DeLorean time machine. We're going to rewind like Marty McFly to yeah. Weston's experience growing up Mormon. And uh, we'll kind of hear a parallel narrative, parallel to a lot of what we heard from Evan's story. So Weston, where does your Mormon story begin? Yeah, so I guess, I don't know, there's there's so many different parts of, <clears throat> of things that I kind of intertwine for me. Um, I guess the first thing, I, even though it might not seem related, I kind of want to talk about is ADHD, because that's probably the first thing, um, you know, I think a lot of my story has to do with just how I felt and, and dealt with shame. And ADHD is probably the first pl thing that really caused me to feel that kind of shame. So uh, I got diagnosed with ADHD last year, but obviously it's been something in my in entire life that I've dealt with. And um, part of that meant that like it, it was really hard for me in school to form proper social relationships with people. and. I remember being even even like five or six and people just not wanting to talk to me because I didn't know how to stop talking once I started and uh, or I would not be paying en enough attention to them during the conversation to and, or I would space out or you know any number of things and just made it so that I was not really well liked at school um, and and really didn't have any like I had a couple of friends like that would be off off and on over the years but really throughout my entire time at school I, I was kind of Isolated, I would say. Um, so I just, I, that's an important piece of context, um, I think, before going into it. And so I remember kind of contrasting that with, you know, going to church and um, you know, especially my baptism. I remember how many people showed up, people that I had never seen before, um, like, you know, my family from out of the country, from <laughs> came all the way from Canada. Some of them, some cousins I had never seen before came from uh, drove like a few uh, four or five hours from Connecticut to where I was baptized in Boston, in the Boston area. Um, and all of these things kind of told me that like, oh, well, if you don't want to be lonely, you need to be righteous. You need to get baptized. You need to do all these things. And that's kind of like the, the framework for, for my Mormonism um, is not so much the doctrinal belief of it, but it's the social need that I, I had that was fulfilled by the church, um, you know, looking back at it. And so pretty much everything I did in the church was to receive either some sort of validation, whether it be from peers or, or from my parents or from other adults, um, just because I, I had so little of that outside of the church that like the church became everything for, for you know, validating who I was as a person. Yeah, I'm thinking about, that's a really interesting framing because for me it was about one true church and authority and the restoration and the apostasy and Joseph Smith and, you know, just essential ordinances to reach heaven. That's a very different framing than like, I may not be loved by my family or I may be cut out or I may be alone if I'm not part of this. That's not my framing growing up. Yeah, and I'm guessing Evan, it might not have been yours. No, I had the same framing that you did. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so I don't know. It wasn't necessarily that it was framed any differently. I think those messages were were still given to me, but I never, I think even from a young age, I never really had like a what you would call like testimony of the church, um, where it was like, you know, I read through the Book of Mormon. I think it's the greatest thing ever, and you know, I'm going to go to church every Sunday because of the Book of Mormon and and my testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith and all this other stuff. And so I think part of that also was that, um, you know, as we, we talked about with him, that my parents really advocated for a love first kind of mode of religion where it was, you be a good person and that's the basis of your religion. And so I thought, you know, I don't necessarily need to believe in the literal truth of the Book of Mormon or believe even that like Joseph Smith was a prophet, as long as I'm being a good person. Um, I can kind of put those things on the back burner and just really focus on the social bit, which was kind of the most important for me, um, you know, being so alone during during school years. So, yeah. Okay. It's kind of interesting because I feel like, um, like you said, John, you had a different framing. I probably had a different framing too, similar to yours. Similar to yours. Okay. Um, 
but I wonder if having a progressive family members, progressive mm. parents create this kind of new narrative of being alone and this is about family and this is about love, but at the same time feeling like you have to be obedient, never leave the church and stay inside the community um, to be part of you know your your family and then the focus is not so much on the truthfulness of joseph or the book of mormon and apostasy and restoration it's more on the societal um aspect of it yeah one of my early mormon stories episodes was with a friend named dr dave christian and he talked about validity mormons and utility mormons validity mormons cared about whether it was true utility mormons cared about whether it was useful and I, th I think what we're ar arriving at is a realization that if you're raised in a progressive, love-based Mormon household, your testimony is rooted in the utility of a social network, which is dependent on the church being strong and vital, mm -hmm. but it's much more about the relationships and the community than it yeah. is about the veracity. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> especially for me, like I... I I feel like the church kind of does prey on people who, like me who are really, you know, desperate for connection with other people. And, um, you know, we'll get more into that later. But as, you know, I kind of start approaching my mission and, and the reasons why I decided to go. But, um, but yeah, so just dealing with all of these things, um, kind of transitioning more towards middle school and high school was um, really difficult because... I mean, any, anyone, there's a, a lot of people who have had, had difficult times in, in, you know, middle school and high school be just because of the same things, right? Like they feel alone, they maybe don't have that many friends or they don't fit in for whatever reason. Um, but I think there are certain things that made it more difficult for me. Um, and the church kind of like compounded on the difficulties that I had where it was like, I was trying really hard to perform a specific brand of masculinity that I saw in, in Mormonism and that I saw, you know, just in society generally, but specifically in, in Mormonism where, you know, I had to be the strong one. I had to be the one who fixed all the, all the like stuff in the house when the house, you know, when stuff broke down or like I had to be the one, you know, the physical, even like the physical build of it. And this is also kind of, I guess, more society mixing with Mormonism, but like the societal expectation that you, or this big buff strong guy and I looked at myself and I'm like I'm more fragile I'm thinner I'm super emotional I you know I like to read romance novels like this kind of stuff I like to write poetry like it just it's I never really fit um the mold and I tried really hard to and so like I would I basically had this group of friends around me that were not really I don't, I don't know really how much of, of friends they actually were because I was kind of more just like someone that they could use to validate their masculinity because it was like, oh, at least we're not as bad as Weston kind of thing. Um, and I, I based a lot of my self-worth off of what they thought about me, which was not good because they never invited me to anything. And, um, and also just in, in the people who I would have gotten along with, I told myself I didn't really want to hang out with because maybe they would smoke or they would vape or they would, you know, drink. God forbid they would drink after a, some, a lot of them were in drama. They would drink after the productions were over. Right. And I'd be like, Oh, can't hang out with them. And I had the stigma, um, where I was, I was like, I have to stay righteous and have to, you know, make sure, um, I'm not, I'm not in, I'm keeping my standards when I'm choosing my friends. So all that led to me being really, really isolated in, in, in high school. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. When you talk about masculinity, which is not just a Mormon concept, but I'm thinking about this idea of man of the house. And if your dad's working all the time and serving in the church, how there might be expectations for you to kind of step up. And then if you add to that kind of the priesthood holder, even if you didn't, weren't 12 yet, there, I, the, the LDS family framework, the, the man leads and your mom's not a man. So I could, I, I guess I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of vibing with this idea that you probably did feel a lot of traditional patriarchy, masculinity pressure that maybe didn't fit like a glove for how you felt about yourself. No, I was really insecure about 
myself and, and you know, my gender presentation. Um, not even, like, I didn't even necessarily have, like, gender dysphoria. Like, I didn't want to be a woman or whatever, but I'm like, I just don't want to be a traditional man. I don't, that's not who I am. And, like, I thought that's who I should be for so long that I, I really tried and put up, to put up this facade. Um, and so... He's being nice, but I think some of that came from me, too. I projected a little bit onto him of this is how you should be. Uh, was there the whole sports thing, like, get you into yeah, sports? Uh, yeah, my mom really pushed me towards signing up for football. And it was going to be – I was going to get signed up for it um, until, you know, his <laughs> – they were like, oh, dad has one to five years left to live. We think it's brain cancer. And then my mom was like, well – maybe we shouldn't be forcing our kids into doing stuff that they don't really want to do at the moment because it's already a lot of stress. Um, so I don't know, that was kind of a small blessing in disguise, I guess. Um, but like, it's, it's just a lot of it, it's so hard because it also, the ADHD thing kind of started coming back again, not just in terms of social stuff, but also, um, you know, with ADHD, you get these kind of flashes of, mo of motivation. Well, you'll do like a bunch of stuff all at once. And my parents would see that and they would. Mm. And then you also have these periods of like where you're just kind of bored out of your mind and not doing anything or you're looking for something that's like more exciting and, and, and stimulating. And so I would come home after school feeling really lonely and dejected and I would go and play video games for eight to ten hours. Like it, it, I would get home at like th two or three p.m. and play till one a.m. And then in high, in high school, once you start with early morning seminary, because, you know, it's not like in Utah where you can, it's part of a class, you have to get up an hour earlier for school, I'd be getting out, going to bed at like 1 or 2 a.m. and waking up at 5. And that's just because, like, I, I didn't know how to exist without having, you know, that amount of, like, video games in my life. Just because it was, it was almost like a, a form of substance abuse for me. Um, just because it was so much, the games I played were very, like, high octane, very... Were they first-person shooters? Or? No, it was uh, League of Legends was the main one. Dude, my son's super into League of Legends. <laughs> so, so what was your main? What were your main character? Which oh, lane? So I, which lane did you do? Okay, so I was I, I mained <laughs> Lux and LeBlanc mid, and I got to high platinum around this time. What? Yeah, yeah. High platinum is a huge deal. Yeah, I don't know so I was in, I was in like platinum. the top two percent of the player base, top one percent of the player base. Um, Lux and who else? LeBlanc. LeBlanc. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you know the Imagine Dragons guys play League of Legends big I time? I do, yeah. <laughs> yeah like Did you like Arcane? Yeah, that song. Yes, that, yes. That's a good Netflix, <laughs> Netflix show, yeah. It, it's funny because I still love the game and I still play it, but I have a much healthier relationship with it now because <laughs> back then it really was just like I need something to forget um, <clears throat> all the stuff that's going on at school. And totally. I totally relate to that. And it's yeah. totally in, tw you know, the 2010s and 2020s. Mm -hmm. That's how kids, that's what kids are dealing with these days. Yeah. And so that's how they deal. It's how they cope. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think my parents looking at, you know, the symptom of that being like, this kid is playing how much on yeah. per, per day, they kind of wanted to clamp down on it. And that kind of, especially cause the, again, with the whole ADHD thing, it was like a lot of times I would just skip homeworks and things like that because I wasn't interested in it or because I, you know, had problems kind of managing my time properly or not getting distracted or any number of things. And um, I just have to ask, how did mid fit your personality versus jungler or ADC or support <laughs> or top? Um, like why mid? Mid was kind of the way, especially that the characters that I played, it was kind of a lot more tactical where it was like, than some of the other roles I thought, I don't know, they're all tactical in their own way, but like, <laughs> It was, it was also a little I'm bit like... I'm just trying to impress my Are, are you viewers jealous that, that John knows about League of Legends and I don't know all the stuff that he I mean, I, I was, I, this I, is I not what I was expecting like to be dad. answered. Like, this is not know. what I was expecting to be talking about, to be honest. But can yeah. I tell you a funny story? Huh? So, can oh, I tell yeah, you a yeah. funny story? Yeah, go ahead. So, so, my, so my son, you know, he's a typical teen. And, uh, you know, at some point I'm thinking, we're going to be the best father-son duo ever. I'm going to be the dad that I always wanted, you know. And by... 14, 15, he's not having any of that. So I'm thinking, well, what can I do to connect with my son? And I'm like, I know I'll learn League of Legends. So I went and learned League of Legends so that I could play with my son. And at first he was super excited about it. And I'm not dumb and I grew up playing video games, but no matter how hard I tried and no matter how much time I spent, 
And I've spent time playing League of Legends here in the Mormon Story Studios <laughs> many, many hours back in the day. I was so bad that he would just get so angry playing with me because I suck too bad for his standard. Because this game is super sophisticated. It's, and it's very sophisticated. Like, like Lots. All the different weapons, all the different characters, all the champions, all the different combinations. Uh, you know, it's it's... Like you think about chess as being like the ultimate g intellectual game, but but you also there's also the dexterity. The dexterity um, element. It's it's <clears throat> you know I really do love the game. I love watching it. Um, but yeah, at that time it was definitely not like I said not a healthy relationship <laughs> with it. I watched him play a couple of times and I thought about trying to figure it out, John. And I was like, I can't do that. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. saved I yourself I, a lot of time because yeah. it did not help. Yeah. It probably made my relationship with Winston worse. <laughs> 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 so anyway, yeah. sorry, I don't mean to make this about me, but no, that's okay. I'm vibing um, with these guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, <laughs> sorry to turn your <laughs> tragic self-medication into my fun. Oh, that's <laughs> Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So I guess kind of <clears throat> my parents really wanted me to, in their eyes, live up to my potential. Cause they saw like the flashes I had where I would like do really amazing on a project or I would write this like really bomb, like amazing essay. Um, and you know, they could see that, that I, I had the capacity to do these things, but wasn't always doing them. And they thought it was just cause, oh, you know, he's addicted to video games or maybe he's lazy kind of thing. Um, and they told me that like repeatedly, they're like, you're not working hard enough. You need to work harder if you're gonna get into BYU. And um, you know, that's where we met. That's where we want you to go. Um, it's cheap school, but also it's the best place for you if you wanna stay in the gospel. Um, and if you want to stay on that path and um that kind of hearing that like because it got to the point and at a certain point where um i was only getting like i was still getting mostly a's but i i it was a good mix of a's and b's um and they started really grilling me about the b's and i started really internalizing a lot of different things about like my self-worth that i from all these different places right from my peers telling me it wasn't enough of a man to my parents telling me I wasn't good enough at school to, you know, the church also telling me I wasn't good enough in, you know, a bunch of different ways at this point. You know, I had discovered masturbation probably around age 13, 14. Um, and that was, I also was using that as a coping mechanism to kind of deal with that. But it would, it would be like this, you know, the classic shame spiral where you feel you do it to like forget the problems and then it just makes things worse because you feel so much more shame um, from the religion. And um, did your parents talk to you at all about masturbation, so you know, when, sexuality? Okay. So I guess yeah. I should, I should probably also back up a little bit and so we can, cause there's all these different things that are converging, right? You can kind of see the train wreck coming, but the last final piece is obviously the, the coming out part. Um, and so I started crushing on this, on this boy in my deacon's quorum. Um, not the same, the same one that we were talking about with my with my dad. Um, and, you know, it was very innocent, right? It's like, I don't, for me at least, it's, it was like a, your classic first crush where it's like, you don't really know what's going on. Um, but for me, doubly so, because it was, you know, a gay crush and I never thought I was going to have one of those, obviously. I didn't even know it was a thing. Um, and so, you know, a lot, we would go to scout camp we went to scout camp together. We did all the the quorum activities together, all the all the Tuesday night mutual activities. We spent we spent a lot of time together, and he was in our school district, and I saw him in a lot of my classes, and um, we became really close. And as the years progressed, I kind of realized that it was not just friendship, but I was also really attracted to him, um, and uh, that's kind of when. It's I, the first time I remember having feelings for him was around, you know, ages 12 or, or 13. And then the kind of, you know, hormones and puberty and all that went progressing and until like at age like 15 around there was when I, I really was like, I can't deny this anymore. And I kind of came out to myself and realized I was gay. Um, so I was also dating a girl. So I kind of buried that a little bit and um, buried that attraction for him and started dating this girl I'd been friends with for years at that point. Um, like we were really good friends and she had been crushing on me the entire time and kind of wanted me 
to be in a relationship with her. And I kind of went along with it because I was like, oh, you know, I, this will be good for her kind of thing. Like, and I, and I you know, I, I do love her um, and I want to make her happy. I thought that was what, you know, that was supposed to feel like. But you had accepted that you were gay by that point? I wasn't, like I had accepted that the feelings were gay feelings. I, I hadn't put the label of gay yeah. on myself yet. Yeah, um, Cause I was like, oh, you know, there's this girl I, I like quote unquote, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I started dating her once I turned 16 because you know, you don't date before you're 16. Um, good Mormon boy. Um, and we had this really nice date at the local fair. And I remember going back into the parking lot and like making out for a bit. And the funniest thing was I got into my car and got, drove home and my brother was there. I told my brother, I'm like, I don't get why this whole law chastity thing is so hard for people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I was like making out with her. We were going at it. And like, I don't know, man, it's not that great. Cause and his eyes got kind of white. He's like, it wasn't, I was like, yeah, dude, like people overhype kissing way too much. Like, like it, it, it wasn't anything to write home about. And he, he was kind of confused, um, but we laugh about it now. I was like, well, obviously, you know, um, yeah. So this I, love chastity thing is going to be easy. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I guess at a certain point though, I realized that, um, like some other stuff happened within the relationship that caused it to fall apart. And I realized that like, I, I, fully came out to myself. I'm like, okay, I'm gay. Um, and, uh, that was kind of when I started looking to come out to a couple of different people. Um, so the first person I came out to is my brother. Wait, wait, wait. Can we go back just a yes, little bit? Yes. Uh, on you mentioned a little bit of masturbation. Yes. Uh, so what your parents would have taught you about it or what would you, would you have learned about it at church and how did you, yeah reconcile that with your actions or whatever and yeah. being gay what have you been taught about yeah. being gay yeah okay so there's, there's sorry I'm, I'm bouncing around a lot That's okay. um, <laughs> cause just because there's like so much stuff that is, is so interconnected to me i don't really know how to unpack it all but i guess um talk more about masturbation um you know i we had gotten tons of lessons about pornography and law of chastity stuff um and I had an interesting relationship with it because we would, I don't know how many third hours I sat through where they would talk to us about this, but it was a lot. It was like, it felt like every couple months that they would bring someone in to tell us like, here's why porn is bad. Here's why you need to stop masturbating. Here's why. And, you know, we would all kind of sit there with like our heads down because, you know, all of us were doing it like, <laughs> and, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I regret some of the, the ways I taught on that topic. Mm. Um, talked about it like a, like an addiction, kind of like the dopamine mm -hmm. hits that you get from it and that sort of thing. Had, had a guy in the stake present a lesson on that kind of science. It's the whole fight the new drug yeah, and you that, know, logic that's, that's not science-based. It's not science-based at all, but mm -hmm. I did it. I taught that and my sons got that. And the reason I did is because I had virtually every single young man in the branch, mm. in the ward, would would come and talk to me about well, about it. So, uh, you know, did did you talk to your okay, dad so, about it? So, <laughs> <sighs> okay, this is this is where it gets fun, I guess. Um, I, th th so the th major thing that I I kind of took from these was that like it was gonna ruin how you see your future wife, right? Like, if you keep doing this you're going to be so overstimulated, right? From the, from the amount of porn use that you're doing that you're not going to be able to get turned on by your wife, right? And, was, and this was kind of the thing that they used to scare us. Being like, you need to stop doing it and you need to save it for your wife. And I was sitting there in my head, I'm like, how is me like reading gay erotica going to affect my wife in any way? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, there's not any even, there's not any women here. There's like, <laughs> and so it, for me, it was like this big disconnect of like, um, more thinking it was wrong because it was more of like an addiction. Right. And I couldn't, like, I couldn't go for, you know, a week without it. Right. Um, and so I, I thought I was addicted and then I was like, 
something was wrong with me um, psychologically or whatever um, in that way. Um, and I was like, oh, this must, like, I'm addicted to, you know, porn in the same way someone is addicted to, like, nicotine or something like that, which I don't think that's... No, it's no. totally false. Yeah. It's, not a, it's not an addiction. Uh, yeah. I'm but, sorry. <laughs> yeah. But, but um, as a result of that, I remember feeling... Again, just more of the shame, right? And it, it, like I said, it's all just kind of compounding at this point where it's like a lot like a lot of the shame, not just from being gay, but also from like having to seek this out, right? Um, this type of stuff out. And so uh, it, it was just a really difficult road to kind of, you know, to, to walk and it just really, it really did hinder my, my self-esteem a lot. Um, Cause it would be like, I, I couldn't ever get all the stars to align where like I was doing well in school. Like I had friends who liked me or, and like I wasn't masturbating. Um, and so there was always some like angle of shame that was, that I was being attacked with. And that's, <clears throat> there's, I'll, I'll generously say it's an unintentional insidiousness about some high demand religions because that's the perfect setup for either fidelity to the church, loyalty to the church, or a personal meltdown is if they can always have you feeling unworthy and inadequate. Yeah. And you're always needing the church to try and purify yourself, to, to cleanse the impurity with the atonement, with the sacrament, with repentance, with prayer, right? Yeah. You're always yeah. on that hamster wheel of trying to hustle for worthiness, but right. you can never quite make it. Yeah. Yeah. I wish we would have known that ADHD was a part of this whole thing too. Obviously I wish I would have known you were gay as well from an yes. early age, but, yeah. um, at, well at the same time I was homophobic, so maybe that wouldn't have been good, but, um, it's hard to parent when you have the wrong instruction manual, you know, mm. church teachings or the instruction manual. And if you use those, that for a gay kid to parent a gay kid, you're, it's, almost tantamount to child abuse. And then you throw in the ADHD element too. And we didn't, we just didn't know how to raise Wes in the, in the way that he deserved to, to be raised. So I, that's a huge regret in my life. And I, yeah. Yeah. So all this is kind of converging. Um, I don't, so I don't talk to anyone. I, 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 I think I only talked, I didn't dare talk to the, like the Bishop before my dad about, I don't remember exactly how the timeline lines up or if, but like, I remember you were the only person I ever talked to about my porn use and it was only after I came out to you. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Um, so this is kind of the point where after I've come out to myself, um, and I'm not really out to anyone else yet that like things really start getting bad because it was also as bad getting worse socially at school. And can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Like a question I asked your dad that I want to ask you that's kind of going back a tiny bit. What was like your Mormon family like? Like was there scripture study? Was there prayer? Was there family evening? Like was it a happy home? Was there music in the home? Like we haven't really talked about yeah. the Mormon context that, that, of your home. That's a good home question. Yeah. As a setup for what comes later. I would say we were <laughs> trying, but we were just too busy most of the time. Um, like he was almost never home. And Wait, so, your dad's bishop, and you're not able to live the Mormon <laughs> bishop lifestyle? trying to make partner, and with like all the health issues. Like I didn't see him for most of my. I was flying back and forth to NIH trying to figure out this health. Like I, I, I legitimately yeah. did not see him for sometimes like a, a week or, or two um, in a row. And so, like my mom also at this time, I think, you know, we we've talked a lot because of you know we have had to unpack all this stuff that happened during this time, and she was really struggling with depression and a lot of these things, um, which made it really hard for her to ge give me what I needed. And it also just made it hard for her to be like that perfect Mormon mother outside of like sacrament meeting, right? Like she she could get dressed up for sacrament and go and like, you know, talk with all the, the young women and, and the Relief Society and do that kind of role of like the bishop's wife. But as soon as she got home, it would kind of just be like back into the, 
into the funk, I guess. And and she like I don't have very many memories of her like laughing or being happy at all from from mo- for most of my life. Um, and so, John, we would do um, family prayer and scripture study uh, by f- phone, FaceTime a lot because I wasn't there. So I'd call in and everybody get around the phone. Do you remember? Do you remember? I remember doing that, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we had family home evenings. Like I would, you know, on Sundays we would justify like going out and playing catch and like you know we didn't have like the formal programs all the time because I, I I got away from that. I didn't like doing that. Um, so I tried to check all the boxes, right. As a good Mormon family, we tried to do all the things, but we had to come up with creative ways to do it because of our schedules. And a lot of times it would be our new year's resolution that like this year we're going to do consistent yeah. scripture study. And you know how new year's resolutions go. It's like within yeah. a couple of weeks, you know, it's falling apart, but we, we were always trying, right. We were always trying to like get the ball rolling and stuff. But like I said, there was between how little, um, time my dad had in, be- in between like all the mental health stuff that my mom was dealing with. It just, it, we weren't ever really like the perfect Mormon family. And this isn't to call you guys out, it's to highlight a really interesting, maybe toxic reality in Mormonism that some of these families that are viewed as the shining examples of like the model Mormon family, the bishop and his family, the Relief Society president and her family, the stake presidency members, to everyone in the ward and in the stake, you know, these are the elite families. These are the families to look up to. These are the families to model, you know, your own family after. And, but sometimes it's almost like the shoemaker's kid. Like you can't live the gospel the way that you would want to because you're too busy trying to to live that corporate ideal and serving in the church. Mm-hmm. And your mom's, de- de- your wife, mom is depressed and your kids are struggling, but then, and maybe you guys are more progressive than many, but the image has to be kept up, yeah. even though things aren't really working behind the scenes. It's no one's fault, but it's just the role you get thrust into. And for some toxic Mormon families like this, there's this really pernicious public versus private thing that goes on, mm-hmm. where public, it looked perfect, and then behind the scenes, it's it's a real mess, like screaming or yelling or violence or, or real dual life kind of toxic kind of stuff. Yeah. And I don't know how much of that applies to you all, but I don't, I don't think it was so much toxic as it was just kind of sad. Like my mom was just, I think she was just sad for a a lot of a good portion of like my, my middle school and high school years. Just, yeah. And the yeah. weird thing is, is that they call it the great plan of happiness. The Mormon plan of salvation is called the plan of happiness. But once I really started digging into polygamy, I realized that so much of the Mormon church and of the history of the, let's just say the corporate Mormon empire in Utah was built on the backs of depressed women yeah, who are nameless and faceless, yeah. but they're the ones who are bearing the brunt yeah. of making all this work. And yeah. Yeah, I think that, that that definitely applies to my mom. And I, I'll i never forget, you know, because I, I started getting the inkling that, like, some of this was not right, right? Like, for, for me personally, I was like, okay, there's, I should not feel this sad, right? Like, I know I'm a teenager and I'm going through stuff and there's hormones, but I think something is worse than it should be. I remember getting home from, I don't remember exactly where it was, but we pulled into the garage Told my mom, like, I don't know what it is. I think it might be depressed or something. And kind of without hesitation, she was like, you don't meet the clinical definition for it. Just like right away. I was like, oh, okay. Um, looking back at it, I'm like, oh, she knew exactly what the clinical de- definition was. I think she was, she was probably seeing, th- seeing a therapist at that time mm-hmm. and um, knew that battle so well that like I think it – almost kind of blindsided her that like I was also struggling with it um, because it, it wasn't presenting in the same way that it was presenting for her right which is just struggling to get out of bed kind of thing for me it was you know going more towards like the suicide angle of it um, so you're both depressed <clears throat> yeah and that kind of leads to us having a really we, we just don't have a good relationship at that during that during these years because of because of that right did you feel Weston like a constant disappointment to your parents? Yes. yes. And I'm sorry. 
I don't know. I just I just really didn't feel like there was I don't know. I I really just didn't feel like there was anything to look forward to a, a, any day, you know, that I, that I I went to school or did anything. Um and I started to think of myself as super lazy. I started to think of myself as a loser because I was playing so much so many video games and you know my parents kept telling me to like get my act together. Um, and the church kept telling me, you know, kind of the same thing at, at a certain point. They're like, you know, you need to focus on getting um, good grades so you can go to BYU and kind of throwing the, the gay thing on top of that and like the fragile masculinity and not having any friends. It's just, it all kind of compounded to the point where I, I, I finally snapped. Um, and so it was... <sighs> The, the thing that, that I remember that I really, the, the, the gospel doctrine that I clung on, on to the most during this time um, was something I think, I don't even know if it's officially sanctioned by the church, but something that one of my Sunday school teachers said that Joseph Smith said about the bottom degree of the celestial kingdom, where if a man could see even the lowest degree of heaven, he would do anything, even giving his own life to attain that and when I, was I taught that I was taught that oh yeah I was, yeah w when I heard that I was like well I mean it's better than here right that's where all the liars and murderers well that's and, where all the people who commit yeah. suicide go so like what what am I doing here it's still a great place yeah and that kind of I don't know during this time I got really into like that that kind of thing and I, I had a lot of different plans that I drew up and ways I would do it um, but as I started getting more intense with that, there was a kind of this moment where like the psychological pressure kind of caused me to break. And I had like, um, I don't know, the doctors call it a migraine, but honestly, I, I don't know if it was a panic attack or a migraine or, or what it was, but it, it well, they was, call it a, it's a specific, it's a hemiplegic migraine, which can be <sighs> brought on by stress and it presents like a stroke, but we had no idea. That's and and it, I don't even know if it, like, it honestly seemed like a New Testament kind of possession to the people yeah. who were watching it, where it was like, I was, I don't remember, I don't remember much of it. I just remember feeling like all the lights starting to go blurry and like someone was messing around in my head and like I couldn't form sentences properly and started slurring my words. And then I started saying things I meant to keep, keep secret, like, oh, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to do, you know, these things. Um and uh, I don't really remember anything after that, but I've, I've been told that, you know, I was taken to the hospital and I was kind of thrashing around, screaming nonsense. Um, I, I was so nervous about a Spanish assignment I had due that I started screaming in Spanish too. And like all the nurses thought that I had taken some sort of drug or something and, or I don't know, it really did seem like I, like I was possessed by something. Um, they tested him for drug use and but kept it was, asking us. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I don't 16? know. 16? 16. So I, I wake up in the hospital, um, had to be sedated, um, wake up super lethargic from all the sedatives and go home. And um, that's kind of where I had like my first, what, I guess you could say like spiritual experience. I don't, you know, looking back on it, I wouldn't apply that word to it anymore. But at the time I definitely, I did where I, just felt so broken. I was sitting there in scrubs on, I, I normally had like the top bank, top bunk in our, in, cause my brother and I shared a room and I was on the top bunk, but I couldn't even make it up the, up the ladder. And I just kind of plopped down on my brother's bed and started crying and crying and crying. I just, I asked God, like I, I didn't do any of the like, you know, dear heavenly father, what you're supposed to do. I just said, God, how did it get so fucked up? And I just had this feeling that like it was going to be okay and that I needed to keep living um, even though I didn't want to. And so from, that was kind of like the point for me where it was like definitely the worst and um, it started improving after that because, you know, I think my parents started to realize that something wasn't right and they started um, making, you know, adjustments <laughs> to kind of how they were talking with me and, and sort of the expectations that they had set on me. Um, I stopped getting after him for his grades. Well, not even just his grades, for 
not putting in assignment. I, I, I was, I lightened up on the school stuff. Yeah. And, and that made a big difference. And, um, was there added pressure cause you were the Bishop's son? Yeah, there was some of that, but honestly, with most of the kids in our ward, I kind of felt like, um, you know, we were just, we were a really solid group and we were all pretty close. And so there wasn't a ton of judgment for, from any of us towards one another. Yeah. It was a good youth. They had a group of like 25 it, active it, youth. They were pretty, they were pretty tight. Especially like, I would say like my age group of guys, mm -hmm. like we were all very close and not very judgmental um, towards one another. Um, and Evan, is there anything else you want to share about his seizure or breakdown? Uh, yeah, it was just, it was terrifying. I mean, we didn't know what was going on with him. Um, you know, he's thrown up and he got a CT scans, all these things. And nobody knew, nobody could answer any, anything that was happening. Um, and I, I just, it's one of those times as a parent when you just feel completely helpless and you wonder what you've missed and what's happened and what's going on. And I, I, uh, it was like the perfect storm just led to that and to, to a snap that caused it. And I, I didn't even know that the storm was brewing. So I, yeah, in hindsight, like so much we should have done differently. And just really quickly, when I think about my own kids and having a PhD in psychology and then having them experience mental illness, you know, for me, it was like, how is this possible? Margie and I, have, as far as we knew, we were the best possible parents. And here our kids are all coming down with depression and anxiety. When I'm an anxiety expert, you know, I imagine there's somewhat of an equivalent thing when you're like a bishop, yeah. you're like helping counsel other parents and other kids and you feel like you've got the Lord's blessing, you're doing what you should be doing, or you wouldn't have been called as bishop, and then your son's yeah. maybe not wanting to live. Did you experience those types of thoughts or feelings? Yeah, I mean, not initially with uh, when the when the, the migraine happened, but um, afterwards when we started talking to Wes and he would tell us, well, after he came out to us and started admitting that he had been suicidal and things like that, then, yeah, a lot of those thoughts were coming, like, why... Why am I not having the gift of discernment with my own child, right? Um, you know, I'm a bishop. I'm supposed to have that. And I'm doing everything I should be doing, but I'm I'm missing a lot of this. So, um, and I think a lot of it was because Wes was very good at keeping it quiet, right? Um, I don't fault him for that at all. I think he was scared. He was scared to be honest with us and scared to, to talk to us. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of it also, again, going back to my mom, it's like she was the one who was spending the most time with me. Um, I think depression just became so normal in our house that like, it was, it was really hard for her to see that like, I was doing worse than maybe I should have, or than I, that I was supposed to be like, I, or that I was, I was at, at that point, you know, because we were all kind of in that swamp, I guess. Um, and Cheryl copes with her depression, you know, a little different. Like as much as it's hard when she has ab bouts of it and she doesn't really deal with it much anymore. She's figured out a lot of different ways to cope. But when she does, she's still high functioning, still does stuff. So when she saw Wes yeah. not being high functioning, it's just like, what's, you know, something else is going on. So. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, at that point it was like, so even coming out of this though, even though I stop actively like making plans and, and, you know, I think I think the reason I had this breakdown is because it was probably it was like when I was going to attempt and it was like my brain's just trying to keep me alive, I guess, um, like just so much stress. It just finally snapped. But after this, it's like I stopped actively making plans, but I would still entertain the thoughts a lot. And I don't know, I I engaged in like a, a lot of what I would call like psychological self-harm where I would imagine all these different ways I would die instead of, um, you know, cutting or, or anything like that. Um, <laughs> funnily enough, it was because of like the toxic masculinity that I didn't like ever really do physical self-harm because I was like, oh, that's something girls do. That's something like, <laughs> I don't know. You, you don't make any sense when you're, when you're that far, like into the, into the, like that mindset. Um, but I would, I would like imagine all these different ways that I would die, like sitting in class whenever I got bored um, or whenever like the lecture was kind of yeah, whatever. Um, that's how I would, that's where my mind would go. And so 
even for the rest of high school, even though I wasn't like at the edge of the cliff anymore, I was still like kind of nearby, um, like looking in, into the valley constantly. So um, that's kind of, and that, that was the environment that I came out in. Um, and uh, it did make things better um, because- R Really quickly, did you say what you had been taught in the Mormon context about same-sex sexuality? Have you already shared that? No. What messages so, did you pick up? The messages that I picked up were kind of mixed because- and, and, and answer from the church's standpoint and then from your parents, and maybe they were the same because your dad was bishop, but talk about both. So can. I was getting really mixed messages from like the church higher ups and what they were saying versus like what my dad was saying as bishop and as a parent to me. Go into as much detail as you're able. And may I say something really quick? I remember, I think the most traumatic, um, probably parts of, of my story, um, being gay and Mormon was probably the priesthood meetings, uh, general, general conference priesthood meetings. Cause that's yeah. when the, uh, the hard topics, it would be Packer or Oaks or one of them talking about either masturbation, pornography, or homosexuality. Or the sanctity and, of marriage. and Yeah, and I knew that one of those topics was going to be talked about on the priesthood so session. The and the place was that just, was the worst in that respect for me was always the temple. Mm. Um, like baptisms for oh, the yes, dead? Oh, yes, that too. Baptisms for the dead, I would go. And uh, I remember, you know, after you finish, the everyone finishes their baptisms, they... The, the officiant or, you know, whatever he's called, will uh, give you a little a little lesson about some of the stuff that you've done there. And I just remember him promising everyone that um, the work that they, they, they'd done today, like the work that we've done today has not gone to waste. It's, there's lots of people who are grateful. And maybe you guys don't understand this yet because you don't have your, your, your own children, but, um, you know, their family is the most important thing. And I promise you all that you're going to have your own eternal families one day. I just broke down sobbing. I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not. It's not going to be me. And everyone thought I was just crying because I was overcome by the spirit or something. And um, it wasn't until, you know, I was on the way home that I confessed to a couple of my friends. I'm like, no. Because <laughs> um, at this point, I was, I was already out to... Um, couple other people, I, I kind of came out to them and was like, look, I, I can't keep going to the temple. This just makes me miserable because it just, it's just a constant reminder of what I'm not going to have, um, what I'm never going to be allowed to have. So I remember talking with my dad about, you know, kind of like how gays are supposed to be treated in the church before um, the policy change in 2015. And then kind of after that as well. Um, even before coming out to him, I, I had these conversations with him. Um, and uh, my dad was always, you know, he was always very um, nuanced in his position about what could change, what could happen. Like, oh, well, you know, it's not, it's some, it, it is something biological. It's like um, nature, not nurture kind of thing. And, we need to be accepting and loving of these people and these people don't get enough acceptance and love in the church and that needs to change. And then the policy change happened and I felt like the message was very clear that 2015? like- 2015? Yes. The one that uh, prohibited, um, you know, children from children of gay couples from being baptized and declared, you know- Apostates. Apostates, yeah. Um, and that to me was like a very clear message. It's like, okay, this is just something that my dad is telling me and that is unique to our ward, but the actual church, right? The, the, where it's actually happening is the attitude is different. Um, I was so mad when the November 2015 policy happened because- You were bishop at the time? Yeah, I was bishop and Wes had come out to us in September 2015, right? So- Holy you had, moly. You had gay marriage legalized in June 2015. Wes came out in September 2015 and then the November 2015 policy and I, you know, I was on vacation with Cheryl in Puerto Rico, and I remember where I was standing in the hotel room when I saw on my phone that that, that leak, you know, that the, the policy had, had been leaked. 
and I couldn't believe it. And I was super mad. And I thought, you know, what are they, what are they doing to my family? Um, you know, Wes can't, if he, if, if he marries now, his kids can't be raised like in the church. Like I just thought they're, they're treating, they're punishing children for the acts of their parents, which goes against Mormon theology. Like you're not judged for your parents, you know, for Adam's transgression. All that. Like there was so much wrong with it. And they didn't trust parents to make good decisions about their kids, whether their kids could go to church if they had gay parents and not have a bad experience. They, they just, it, there was so much, there wasn't a trust of agency. It went against Mormon theology. I thought so much. And I was so mad. I just said, you know what is wrong? It's going to change. I just said, I, this is one of those things where it's just wrong. So yeah, I don't, I don't blame Wes for feeling like he was hearing a different message from me than he was feeling from the church. Cause at that point when that happened, it, that was very clearly, I felt strongly in the other direction. And so I kind of, between that and all of the polygamy stuff with Joseph Smith and blacks in the priesthood, I, I did, like I was saying earlier, like it didn't, there was no way you were going to convince me that the church was intellectually true at that point. I was like, you know, we could go in circles about this, but I'm not going to like have a, like a, the traditional testimony of like Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon and did all these things and was a great man. Um, or that like, I don't know, that even like any of the prophets were really that divinely inspired when they were doing stuff like this. That was clearly, I was like, if they were actually divinely inspired, they would have not done this November 2015 policy change. And so <laughs> you might ask, well, then why did you stay in the church? And the answer is that I, I couldn't leave. It was the only thing that I, I like this, this solid church friend group was the only thing I still had. Um, that was kind of keeping me back from the edge of the cliff, right? Um, and it just led to me feeling really trapped. And I, I did feel like really miserable for the rest of, of, of high school. Um, and kind of, I guess, more as I was looking to go on a mission. So. John, I don't know if you want to go back and ask for the, I think we teased the listeners about something oh, when yeah. he came out to me. The thing that he remembers yeah, most, yeah, and that I, yeah. So that. I remember because <laughs> it's not a trivial thing. Even if your dad's seemingly LGBT affirming, he's still the Mormon bishop. Mm -hmm. So that can't be easy to come out to your dad when he's so a bishop. So when I remember thinking about this, I was like, <clears throat> okay, there's like an 85 percent chance that they accept me, and like 15 percent chance that they don't. But I think that what a lot of people don't realize, and why it's so hard to come out, is like that 15 percent chance. Well, I was small in my mind. I was like a you know, if I, if I roll the dice and it comes up wrong, then I might be kicked out of the house. Um, like, I don't know, I don't know what my living situation might look like after that. I don't know what the consequences are going to be. I'm already struggling with my mental health. Like I can't, I can't take another hit. Um, and so it took me coming out to my brother first and then to my aunt. And it sounds kind of cynical, but I was like, at least if they disown me or whatever, then I can go to her place. Um, Cause I know she'll, you know, take me in whatever. Um, that was also part of why I came out to her first. Um, and, uh, yeah, when I did come out, it was in the car and I was, I remember being really, really nervous, obviously. And, um, he just, you know, he, he asked me the stuff he said, he's like, Oh, are you sure that you're gay? I was like, yeah, I'm sure. Um, what was that like that for me? It was, it was like, I don't know. I could tell he was kind of from his body language that he was like, okay with it. And then he started asking, this is, I, I don't remember the other details. I just remember you started asking me, so you're like, so like, have you looked at the sports illustrated swimsuit model collection? <laughs> I was like, what? He's like, you, you look at women like that and nothing <laughs> like, and then, and then he started asking me the specifics. <laughs> He's like, you know, boobs, butts, like, <laughs> anything and he's just like bewildered like 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 this doesn't make any sense and it's funny because it's like going my dad is it, it's very in character for him because growing up I would he always hear these comments about my mom where it's like your mom has the best butt out of any woman in the entire world <laughs> or like she's so beautiful like totally smitten with her all the time and so I think for him once I kind of answered I was like no he's like okay you know fair enough and 
I, I don't know. I, I didn't get it. I was trying to get it. It was such a different and wild response from what I was expecting that like it made me feel a lot more at ease with things. Like, okay, this is still my dad. This is like, you know, like, nothing. Nothing has really changed that much between us. Um, and I don't know. I felt grateful for that. So. Want Gerardo boobs, butts, anything? <laughs> Gerardo's like, nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> it was just so foreign to me, and I wanted to make sure I got exactly like, what? <laughs> That's why you didn't get to ask the the other young man that came, came right. out to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can be more open with my son. <laughs> but I'm glad he felt like I wasn't disappointed at everything. I was honestly just trying to understand. Yeah. I was trying yeah. to, to, to get it, but. Yeah. I get sure. Yeah. 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 And uh no, it was after that that like I think one of the times when I masturbated after that that I went to him and was like, Hey, this is a problem I've been having for a long time and haven't told anyone about and we kind of it was weird to talk about. But he also had set up a policy with us where it's like you can say that this ha conversation happens as a bishop yeah. and I'll treat it like a bishop. If you say you want to come to me as dad, then you know it'll be like, you know, different treated differently. Um so that was a conversation I definitely had. I was like, you are a bishop right now. Like, I'm, you're not, not allowed to tell mom about this. Um, so, yeah. 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 So you, so at the end of coming out, you felt what? I felt, I definitely felt loved, especially because my mom, you know, she was always, she's always been, I think, the more accepting one. And so yeah. she just, it, she loved me so much in that moment that it honestly surprised me because I hadn't, she'd been in such a, like kind of depressed place for so long that I wasn't really used to getting that much affection from her. And so to have her be super affectionate and give me this hug and tell her how much, have her t tell me how much she genuinely loved me, um, really resonated with me and really kind of, I don't know, changed the course of our relationship. So yeah. in a good way. Cheryl was, I think a lot of times approaching the kids the way she felt I thought she should um, with church stuff. I think there was a lot of instinctive things that she wanted to do that she felt like she couldn't. But in that moment, all that went out the window. And she just, you know, I love you. And if you need to stop going to church, stop. I love you. So, she so was the also, mom the dragon comes out. 100%. Yeah, she was also 100%. crying a lot just because she, I just think she recognized how hard it was going to be for me, especially with, like, all the stuff that I was going to go through. I think she had a better idea of, of that than anyone else. Um because I, I think she realized that like in her own journey that getting deeper into the church wasn't gonna solve the problem. And that was kind of the tra trajectory I was on with, with preparing for the mission. Yeah. And you came out to your brother before you came out to your parents, yeah. is that right? Yeah. And in, uh, can I say who else or do you not want to say? Yeah, his aunt. My aunt, said, yeah. Mentioned that. yeah. So you came out, you've, you felt safe enough with your aunt and with your brother that yeah. you were able to test that Mm -hmm. test the waters before you came out to your parents yeah yeah, yeah his aunt had, had left the church and was actually pretty vocal mm -hmm. about being supportive of lgbtq rights and stuff like that so she was so a when you come person. out openly you create a space a safe space for some to come out to you who yeah. otherwise yeah wouldn't feel comfortable right yeah, yeah. exactly so, so we've got to give a shout out to your aunt and your brother a little bit for yeah sure. for sure yeah. Um, and your mom and and her, dad. Yeah. yeah, everyone. I, I feel really lucky, especially, you know, knowing more queer people now that it's still a rarity um, <clears throat> to get this much support from, from family. And so I, I honestly don't know what I would have done without, without this response. Let me ask you about that really quickly. So, you know, I, I started tuning into the suicidality question in 2001 when I learned about Stuart, Stuart Mattis shooting himself mm -hmm. on the steps of his local, you know, California Mormon chapel. Yeah. And then I, you know, met Margie's um, cousin who had been suicidal. And, and then I moved to Utah and start paying attention to the Desert News. And I started seeing the obituaries of all these young theater loving, you know, high school kids who seem to be dying with no explanation. And, and, and then I start interviewing people for more stories. So by 2005, six, seven, I'm pretty sure there's something that's a real problem. And then 2008 happens with prop eight and it just like triples. And so, you know, I start my PhD 
2009 and I start really targeting this issue, studying it for my dissertation, teaming with Bill Bradshaw mm -hmm. to do a deeper study on the LGBT Mormon experience. And of course, by 2013, 14, 15, a huge issue is being made in our culture about suicidality, the triple the suicide rates of other states in the United States. You know, I work with Tyler Glenn and Dan Reynolds to do the movie Believer. Yeah. And the whole emphasis in all that is just to build awareness to the problem of Mormon youth, teen suicidality, and sometimes homelessness when the kids get kicked out. You know what I mean? Um, fast forward to now, and even back then, the church would wheel out its apologists and say, no, 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 it's not Mormonism that's causing the suicidality. It's the altitude, you know? And, and apparently there is a study tying altitude to suicidality at some level, you know, in the Rocky Mountain region. But also they would say it's, you know, it's other things, we don't know, we don't have the data, you're jumping ahead. And even now, just recently, the church has come out with this study where they've said, like, they found that, like, LGBT, non-Mormon LGBT youth in Utah have higher depression rates or even suicide rates than LGBTQ youth in Utah. And they're using that as a way to tell people, see, our, our queer youth within yeah. Utah Mormonism fare better than secular queer youth in Utah. The church is good with the gays. You know what I mean? Um, and you're smiling. Why are you, yeah, why are you because smiling? Because I talk about, well, I talk about, I, I cite a bunch of studies in my book. My book is really just like a resource manual of a lot of that stuff. And I, you know, on the, on the altitude thing, there's a study that, uh, just recently done, I forget, I think it's James McGraw, um, yeah. from Bowling, Bowling, you know, yeah, where the, um, LGB, non, L, the LGBTQ, uh, Mormons, um, outside of Utah, so not in the altitude areas, uh, fare worse from a mental health perspective than the, the non-LGBTQ, non-Mormon LGBTQ people in those places. So th there's- And he's the same yeah. one that did this study that John was talking about. Yeah. I don't know if you know. Is he? Yeah, I did, yeah, yeah. I did, yeah. But, but he's a progressive Mormon. He is, but, yeah. And the church has used his, he was really careful when he released this study. And I'm sorry, we're going into detail on this, but um, yeah, so when he released the study and he said pretty much we we didn't think we were going to come up with these results. He said people should not jump ahead and make assumptions as, as to why Mormon LGBTs in Utah are doing better than non-Mormon LGBT. Um, could be because of different reasons, but he published the results. I didn't know he did another study outside of Utah. Yeah. Uh, but the church used his study from Utah to promote, to say what you're saying, John. See, like Mormonism is helping LGBT yeah. kids in Utah. But from what I understand too from that study that shows that Mormonism is helping LGBT it, it actually doesn't because the the people that are in the LGBTQ members that they're interviewing are the ones who have stayed in Mormonism. Right? So if you're gonna ask the ones who are it's like the survivor the survivorship bias, mm. right? You're asking the ones who were able to tolerate it, who actually has stayed, yeah, they're doing pretty well. Well guess what? That's because they're the minority that's been able to tolerate it. If you're gonna ask them, it's gonna be skewed. And you're gonna see you're you're ignoring the vast majority for whom the trauma is, is the, 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 the teachings cause trauma. I mean, Brian Simmons' study from the University of Georgia in 2017 was pretty clear about that. It was like 89.3% of LGBTQ Mormons in that study. And that included, you know, a lot of people that had temple recommends, others that were inactive. It was the broad swath. They had trauma from church teachings on marriage, gender, sexuality, that sort of thing. So I think, I think James McGraw does a great job. But I think his findings are twisted, I think, by a lot of apologists and others. Yeah, to, for to, sure. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, for the, no, sorry for that's, the tangent. No, that's yeah. important. Yeah. And uh, we'll make sure and include a link to your book in the show notes yeah. because I'm glad you've assembled that research. What I like to do every time I do this interview, because you get, you get these apologists that just want to say, stop picking on the church, stop blaming the church for suicidality. It's too complex. We don't know enough. It's, it's, you're, you, you're basically weaponizing our LGBT youth for your own agenda is kind of what the attack is coming at me when I talk about LGBTQ suicidality. 
So, Weston, I wanted to give you a chance to say you were an LGBT gay Mormon youth and you were suicidal. And I know it happened twice, but let's just talk about the first time. If, if, if someone were to say to you, Weston, you were faring better than your non-LDS counterparts. Or Weston, it was the altitude, even though you were at sea level. Yeah. You know, <laughs> what, what would you say in all seriousness, in a heartfelt way, to Mormon apologists that want to say the suicidality has nothing to do with being Mormon and LGBT? Well, I have had people say this to me. Um, had former mission companions come and tell me that, you know, I didn't try hard enough to live on the covenant path, and that's why I was suicidal. If I had been more faithful, then I would have actually seen the benefits of, you know, gospel happiness. Um, and it made me angry enough that I wrote a book. So this whole book is really, like, it's... I wanted it to be a testament that the church has blood on its hands. And... It took me a long time to, to, to even, like process this enough to where I could I could really formulate my anger towards a church in a specific way, but I can't I can't think of any other way to say it other than like if if there was an institution that tried to take away your life, has taken away the lives of many people in your community, and has not apologized for it, but rather has increased the amount of they they've ordered more muskets to be fired at you and your community, then what, how am I supposed to forgive? How am I supposed to move on? It, how, there's no accountability yet. No one from the church is acknowledging that, like, when, when apologists say this kind of thing, it flies in the face of hundreds of thousands of, of, of personal experiences, and it is just insulting on a level that I don't think they fully understand. If you had to distill it for you, what was it about your Mormon beliefs, your Mormon experience that made you feel suicidal? If you had to distill it in a minute or two, take, take your time, but like distill it for us. It was this conundrum of knowing, especially, and we'll get into this more when I get on the mission, because this is where it's really exacerbated, of knowing that I am profoundly unhappy and that the church's doctrine is causing this profound unhappiness because of the cos cognitive dissonance it's creating. Um, and simultaneously, the church having enough control over me to prevent me from leaving and actually bettering my mental health. Um, and so it's in, in a way that like a lot of other religions aren't, like the Mormonism keeps you from leaving. Um, and that for, that for me is, I think, what drives a lot of people to commit suicide instead of, of just leaving the church and finding something else. Because you're told that it's, you, you don't have anywhere else to go. This is the one true church. Um, and Where will you? I mean, they literally say, where will you go? Yeah. Right? right? Yeah. And, and so, and again, the, the teachings about the, the telestial kingdom and that kind of thing, um, and, and also that it, it's it's better in the life to come or that you're, you're, you're cured of this in the life to come. Um, all of that kind of weighed on my mind when I was, when I was there, but also just the fact that like, does that make you want to accelerate you getting to the next life? Oh yeah. Because Absolutely. this life's going to suck, but the next life's great. Yeah. So let's get there quicker. Yeah. I don't mean to put words in your no, mouth. No, no, absolutely. And, um, some people say the church doesn't teach that, but there's clear, some well, quotes from a lot of brethren and in a pamphlet that, that, that this is a there, mortality there's also only just, thing. Yeah. I mean, Mormonism has a, has a very high value on martyrdom too, where I felt like if I were to take well, my own, Jesus was a martyr and Joseph was a martyr. Jesus was a martyr. Joseph was a martyr. Like there's scriptures. We have hymns, you know, praising both of those things. And so I felt like, if I die, I'm going to be doing a service to God somehow, right? Even if even if you could talk me off of that and, and logically explain to me, that's the feeling that that you leave uh, queer people with when when you when you do this. Um, and um, 
it's just insulting. It, it's really, it, I don't think I've ever been as insulted as I was by that one mission companion who insinuated that, that if I had just been a little bit um, more faithful that I, I would have, I would have found a way to make it work. Um, it's like saying, you, you know, you're, you're taking poison and someone says, well, if you just taken more poison, you would have been better. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And that's one angle you could have done more, but the other angle is stop blaming the church. It's not the church. I mean, maybe for, you could argue that in high school for me, but when I'm on the mission, absolutely not. It was 100% the church, church's responsibility. Um, I wouldn't give, I wouldn't let high school, Mormon high school off. I, I wouldn't either, but if, if, if I'm being like a really hardcore apologist, you know, the, when I was on the mission, the church had 100% control over my thoughts and actions practically, right? Because that's what the mission is designed to do. It's designed to, to make you into a servant of Christ who is doing and being a mouthpiece for the church. Um, and fulfilling that role, again, kind of jumping a gun again before, before I get to the mission experience, but that fulfilling that role was, I, 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 I was really close to coming home in a box. And I was encouraged to stay, even though I knew that that was gonna be the case. And I had to actively fight and advocate for myself. And if I didn't have the courage to do that, or if I didn't have my parents, if I didn't have my mom telling me every, every week to just to come home, if I didn't have a family that I felt like was supporting me or, or you know, that network, I don't know what I would have done. Actually, I, I do, and it's not pretty. So I... So the church it, makes you feel trapped. It, it, it made me feel trapped. Um, and honestly, if it weren't for my parents and, and having that out where I knew they would support me regardless, then I would, I would have stayed trapped because it, it takes people who are vulnerable, like queer youth, who are, who are more likely to be marginalized like I was, right? Um, you know, for, for not either conforming to, to gender expectations or, or to be bullied for their sexuality or, or, or you know, what have you. And it, create, it forces them into the social network that I, w I was forced into where everything is done through the church. All of your validation comes through the church, right? You have to be righteous because that, your righteousness is the only medication that they give you to treat the, to treat the loneliness, to treat the, you know, all the other stuff that, they're, they're, that you're feeling naturally from being a queer person, right? Um, and so it's just... It, you know, the, like I said, this is why I wrote a book about it because getting these emotions out in the way I want them to, um, you know, over over a conversation is hard for me um, to to adequately say everything I want to say. But I think my experience speaks for itself in terms yeah. of that. And I think the experience of of thousands of other of, of queer youth who, you know, it also speaks. Like you can't have the entire, all, every single queer person coming out of Mormonism saying that it was Mormonism and, it, and then argue that it's not Mormonism. It's like we're telling you what the problem is. So just listen instead of, instead of you know, telling us that something's wrong with us instead. So to distill, it's a combination of being told you're broken and bad, feeling awful within it, um, being told that you can't leave it, that this is the one true good place. So you're stuck in it. And then your only out is to die. Are those the main components? Yeah, I think a major problem with Mormonism and just, and in, in this is in general, not, I mean, obviously it would help queer youth, but I think it helps a lot of people who are struggling is that they need to let go of this idea that Mormonism cannot, it is, has a, has a monopoly on truth. Because if you don't have anywhere else to go, it, it just, it leaves you feeling so trapped. And I, know, and I know that because of the doctrine that that's very unlikely to change, but that has to be the thing to, for me that contributed the most to, to my mental state. Even if it's not a monopoly on truth, that it's the place where all truth is found. I think the church acknowledges there's truth <clears throat> in a bunch of areas, but to be able to say, to have that elitist attitude and say, yeah, yeah, truth is everywhere, but we have it all. We have everything um, that leaves people with 
not much hope for anything else being better outside. Whether it's called the one true church, one and only yeah. true church, exclusive authority, right. the the fullness of the gospel, right. you know, it's there. The yep. good ship Zion, you know, d- stay in the boat, right. all that rhetoric, uh, and the rhetoric of superiority, it makes you feel like where can you go? You can't go anywhere. It takes You're a lot stuck. of courage to, take, to jump out of the boat. Yeah. After hearing all that, it takes a lot of courage to go take a step elsewhere. And something, something, Weston, that I've heard in a lot of LGBT Mormon accounts that I haven't heard in yours is that you try to pray it away. You you try to be super righteous. You try to to have the atonement fix you. And then when it doesn't, then you think I'm so bad that even God and Jesus can't fix me. That's an I, element I, that I'm I not probably hearing would in yours. Have. I would have tried doing that if it weren't for my, my dad, you know, um, really hammering it home that this was a, a you know, hammering home the, the science of it, which is that, you know, this is how I was born. This is who I am. And his acceptance of that when I came out really prevented me from ever going down that route and made me realize that that's, that thinking that way is delusional and it, it didn't have a place for me. So That would have been a harmful addition Oh, it would have, it would have absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, so many in 2022, so many LGBT affirming quote Mormons think that by like no longer supporting conversion therapy with therapists, that they've solved a big problem. And now, and this, you know, even Ty Mansfield does this. It's like, well, I'm not for conversion therapy. I'm for trusting in the atonement. And I'm like, it's I don't, I think that's worse. Same. Yeah. I yeah. think that's worse to tell people to have faith in Jesus. If you're gay. Yeah. Oh, I want to get, I want to get to right. the, to the mission. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's now. do that. Let's do that. Okay. Yeah. So well, let's go. Let's, let's back up. Backtrack a bit. Yeah. You came out to your dad. I just wanted <laughs> to give you a chance to, to say that here and we can say it again yeah. and we can say it. Yeah. I, but I wanted to take a moment to let you articulate. I will just that. say like, if, if, you want the full, to, I would also say to any apologist, if you want the full story of how, exactly how I feel about that, you know, read the book. Because I really, you know, I might I might have said a couple of things that are not 100% logically sound here in, in the heat of the moment, but I've really put thought and effort into, you know, making sure those words come across correctly um, on the page. So, okay. sorry. Um, Thank you for doing that. Yeah. We're going to put that on TikTok. Okay. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I come out to my dad and um, come out to my mom. Um, and then I'm starting to get to the point where I'm graduating high school. And there's a couple of options for me. So when I was applying to schools, um, don't apply to schools when you don't think you're going to live to go to college. Um, it doesn't work out very well because I only apply to the BYUs and I got in to BYU and BYUI and, and here in Hawaii, but um, I was really like, so I basically had to choose between BYU, going to BYU or going on the mission right out of high school. Um, and um, I, there was still, even though like my relationship with my parents was, was getting better and there was still, you know, they were easing back on all the pressure. Um, I still felt like I had been really lazy throughout all of high school and I wasn't living up to my potential and that I wasn't a hard worker and, you know, that I need to learn how to do that before I went to college. And I thought, okay, well, I've been told my entire life that the mission is the hardest you're ever going to work. So um, if I go on the mission, then no one's ever going to be able to tell me again that I'm not a hard worker or that I'm not trying my best um, or anything like that. And so it was kind of for that reason that I went um, in addition to kind of you know, my dad's gone on a mission. My uncles have gone on a mission. Um, grandpa. And then, yeah, kind of grandpa was... was He went on a mission too. But yeah, yeah went on a mission. But so my grandpa this time, his dad, um, was um, dealing with brain cancer and um, only had... It was, it was clear that he was declining really fast. Um, and he his whole thing had always been missionary work. He served as a mission president um, in Tennessee served his own mission in Australia. That's true. Um, oh. Yeah. And so... No, he served in the same... He was in Tennessee as mission president in the same area where my mission president was from. That's Tennessee. Yeah. 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 And so um, 
I was the oldest grandson, and so none of his other grandchildren had left on a mission yet. Um, and I knew it would mean a lot to him as a kind of farewell to give him my mission call. And uh, so I put my papers in right out of high school. And, you know, I gave him the call and, and told him where I was going. And he was really exci excited and, um, you know, cried over the phone and told at this, me. At this point, he couldn't really remember much, um, function very well, but he remembered Weston's name. He remembered my name that one time. He didn't remember when I visited him in the hospital, but he remembered when yeah. I called him to give him the mission call, which is interesting. Um, but he uh, told me how proud of me he was, and that's kind of like one of the last things I, I think I ever heard from him. He died a month after Wes so, got his mission call. He died a month later. So I, I went to his funeral, and then I was kind of off to the field. Um, I'm kind of blown away that not only are you gay, but you've come out to your dad, who's your bishop. You've come out to your family. And on some level, you don't totally believe the church is true. And yet you're like, so I'm going to serve a mission. You know what I mean? I like, was so desperate to just feel some sort of validation from like, because I, I like the biggest thing I still had in my mind um, was that I was a loser, right? Because I didn't have any friends. I didn't have, I spent all my time playing video games. And so I really just wanted to dispel that. And I knew, you know, going on a mission would, would do that. And, and with I, I, part of the thing that you redeem yourself. Basically. Yeah. 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 And the part of the desire to kind of please my, my dad, you know, his grandpa comes from the place that my dad was a good man. He just, he, he had a good kind heart. Like when I, one of the things I forgot to mention before, but when I was told that I probably had brain cancer and I called my dad and I told him, he said, I wish I could trade places with you. That was like his instant response. And that comes from a guy who, you know, 30 years prior had just survived cancer himself. He was a good man. And I think he let his grandkids know that he loved them. He was very orthodox believing, um, but had that kindness and love. And I think to seek validation from a guy like that, who was like, what Mormonism can produce in its best form, I think made sense for, for Wes to try to get some validation from him. Yeah. So. Yeah. But what in the, in the research biz that's called internalized homophobia, it's basically self-hatred. Yeah. Doing something like serving a mission to sell the doctrine of a church that kind of hates you yeah, it's well, a it's a deep kind of twisted form of internalized oh, it homo was, negativity or homo. I don't mean to get all technical. No, it was definitely and, like and a, and it was definitely like some like self flagellation a little bit where it's like oh, you know I haven't really done anything worthwhile in in high school so, you know I'm going to torture myself a little bit with this because I deserve it kind of thing. Um, it's yeah, hard. that's so, hard. He told me when I asked him. So his mom begged him not to go on a mission because she knew it would be hard for him, right? Yeah. Um, I didn't take that approach. I was like, hey, Wes, you don't need to go. <laughs> um, if you want to go, fine, but you don't, you don't need to go. And I remember you told me one night that the church was good for 95% of the people in the world, and it helped them be better people. And so he wants to go and help that 95%, even though he's in the 5% that the church is bad for. And I was like, I was blown away by his generosity and his kind of approach to just wanting to help other people that way. Um, I don't know if that was a sincere statement at the time. or It was, feeling, it was, it was all, there was, there was a lot of that too, where it's like, I'm going to go and I'm going to help people. And so I guess this kind of leads naturally into the interview with the state president um, where he, you know, they have to ask you like, why are you going on a mission? And I told him that, right. Where I'm like, I'm going to help people. I want to, I really did. I, I really want, you know, I, wanted to be Christ-like. I wanted to help people and, and understand their, their struggles and all the, all these things. And, um, and I told him this and he kind of looked at me funny, um, because almost like it wasn't the answer I was supposed to give. Um, he's like, I think he wanted me to say like, Oh, I'm going to go and I'm going to baptize people and bear my testimony of Joseph Smith and all the, you know, all this stuff and the book of Mormon and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I think it kind of caught him off guard a little bit. Um, and, uh, but I, I remember, so the beginning of my mission journal is really telling actually, um, when I, when I get to the, the, so I, I got called to Curitiba, Brazil, um, 
And I was really excited about that because I really loved learning languages and um, thought it would be a good opportunity to kind of experience a foreign culture and all, all those all that kind of thing. Um, and so I went to the to the missionary training center in Sao Paulo, and um, my the mission entries, the journal entries I have from that time. Um, I think you mentioned on your outline, Evan, that the he's call that your calling took a little bit. And oh yeah, did you tell your stake president you were gay? How did oh, he react? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, uh, I totally f I can't believe I skipped over this part. Yeah. During in that same interview where he was kind of you know looking at me funny and whatever, got towards the end of the interview and he, um, you know, we get to the chastity question, and I answer, um, you know, talk about like, you know, my past porn use and whatever and how I've you know successfully been you know able to stop masturbating or whatever when I really was still something I was doing just because I, I really felt like I needed to go on the mission and I was okay with like, you know, bending the truth a little bit in my eyes um, to do that. Like every Mormon young man yeah. almost ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Except Gerardo. <laughs> <laughs> but then I also said, you know, not 100% of the porn is straight. Um, and she was kind of, like taken aback by that he's like okay well which is a true statement because none of it was right so <laughs> yeah <laughs> well well then I, I lied immediately after when he asked me he's like well what percentage i'm like well it's about 60 40 for straight stuff i'm 60 i'm like i'm bisexual i'm 60 percent into girls i'm 40 percent into guys um but you knew you were gay oh i knew i was gay so why it was a, it was a white uh, so were you lying to increase your chances of that's what, how i thought it. i thought of it if he sees me as mostly straight then maybe he won't see me as gay um and maybe like i can still go on a mission um mm. and maybe it won't be as much of a problem um so it was like this this constant battle of like recognizing and, and trying to be as open as i could but also trying to keep myself safe um and trying to do the things that I, I, I wanted to do. So, yeah. um, yeah. And so did, did he respond with anything? He said, he, I'm glad you stopped some, something. He told me that he would give the same advice to any elder, but that if there was anything that was causing me to, you know, be more sexually active, if I had a, you know, if, like if, for example, if you had a girlfriend or if you had a, you know, some guy that you were interested in that was causing you to have more of these thoughts, then you need to try and cut that influence from your life because the, you know, the adversary works his hardest in the months leading up to the mission to try and get missionaries to, you know, uh, defect from the Lord's cause. So, um, that message was pretty clear to me. Um, I actually did have a guy I was really interested in that I'd been messaging back and forth and I'd met up with a couple of times. And after that, I, I just ghosted him full stop. Um, and that was really hard for me too. Um, and so all, all of this kind of came together and, but I, I did get my mission call and I arrived in the, in the CTM. It took him eight weeks to get his mission call, um, which is a really long time. How long? Eight weeks. What um, would it normally be? Like four max. So I, I actually called the state <coughs> president. I was like, well, you know what the delay is here? And he assured me that it wasn't, you know, that he was being treated. I wasn't the bishop at the time. I'd been released um, a, almost a year before. Um, but I had, was the same state president that I had served with, so I had a pretty good relationship with him. And, and yeah. he, assured me, he assured me that he wasn't getting treated differently because he was gay. Um, but I, I don't know. You have your doubts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so at the CTM, um, I don't know. It, people have this this image, especially in the church, of, of the missionaries as like these very righteous, like you're the closest people to Christ kind of thing. The CTM, especially once they lowered the age to like 18, it just, it was, I basically tell people, it's like, it's like a frat, but you study the scriptures all day and there's no CTM alcohol. stands for MTC. Uh, MTC in, Centro, Brazil, in Portuguese. Treinamento Missionario, yeah. Um, For those who don't know. Yeah. Um, Missionary Training Center. And uh, 
Yeah, I don't know. I had a really hard time in the in the in the CTM, and my journal entries are. Looking back at them, I'm like, oh my god, this is. I I my one of my first entries is. You know, I've been miserable for the past four years of high school. What's two more? I'm like, that's so melodramatic. But it's also honestly how I was feeling at the time. Like it was, it was, really just like I'm going to keep suffering, and like I know it's, I know I want to keep being alive mostly because I don't want to let anyone feel sad that I'm gone but I didn't really have any reason to keep going per se um, and so that's kind of how I went throughout the entire mission and um, yeah I, I don't know the CTM was really hard for a lot of people just because of, of like the strict routine and not being able to you, you have even less agency than you do on the mission um, it's like very regimented and it's, and it's where they really first try to like kind of break your spirit a little bit um, because I, I went in there I was like I'm going to be a missionary who helps people I'm I basically viewed it as more of like a service mission than like an actual mission mission of like converting people I'm like I'm just going to be a positive force in people's lives I'm going to try and do what Christ would do um, and I don't even I don't think that necessarily means baptizing people um, but in Brazil especially it's like you baptize you you baptize you baptize you baptize and so I butt heads a lot with my trainer um, or like the the professor in the C, in the CTM um, teacher yeah um, and um, but yeah I don't know I, I managed to make it through and and got to the field where I met my mission president um, my mission president I feel really lucky that I got the mission president that I got um, <laughs> so when I he, he's just a, he was a really high up in, in the church education system. Um, he's a CES guy. And, uh, from Brazil? No, from, from here in Utah. Okay. So he was, he's honestly one of the most gentle people I've ever, I've ever met in terms of everything. And his love for, for just everyone is very apparent from the moment that you meet him. Um, and so I felt really comfortable with him and, I went into the first interview because I, I, I had promised myself I was going to do this because I was like, I need, if I, anyone needs to know this, my mission president does. And I went into the first interview with him, you know, fresh off the plane and told him, you know, I'm gay. You know, this is probably going to be something I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to, this, this will be a recurring theme of my problem, like of my, you know, faith struggles on the mission. So I'm just telling you now, so you can kind of know where I'm at. And he appreciated that I told him and he told me, he's like, you know, probably best not to tell other missionaries just because you don't know how they're going to react oh, kind wow. of thing. Um, <laughs> and I, what, what, year, what does that feel like? Oh, what year was that? Yeah, this was, so I left my mission in 2017 um, and arrived, this was 2017 to 2019 was when I served. So was he saying that as a, out of a place? You didn't feel like he was saying you should be ashamed of being gay. He was more saying, I want to protect you from the homophobia of maybe other missionaries. Yes. Or, yeah. yeah. I, I didn't think it was, it was like, it was, it, yeah. Um, and then he also of said, of course, but then why is he not training his missionaries to not, yes. be, homophobic? not be homophobic? Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause that's a topic you don't really talk about it. I mean, I, I right. can't imagine a missionary, a, a mission president having that no. as a regular course of instruction for missionaries as to how to avoid homophobia. It's just not something mission presidents, it's yeah. not on the, not on the curriculum. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so after I, uh, he also said, you know, he was, he's like, I'm going to call your parents. Cause I think he did feel like a little bit out of it, out of his depth. Um, like he hadn't really encountered it before. And he's like, I'm going to call your parents and, and have a chat with them. Like, um, at this point, I was I was I was serving in the state presidency. At this point, I've been called as first counselor in our state presidency. So, Mr. President calling a first counselor in state presidency to talk about you know gay son serving mission and a good conversation with him. He's he's a good guy. He was very kind hearted. Um, neighbor to my my sister lived in the same neighborhood as my sister when he before his mission. So we had connections mm -hmm. with him. He's a good guy. Yeah, um, and he he did like uh, the reason I I also kind of got along well with him was because that was. Compared to all of the other mission presidents in Brazil, he was a lot more of the like love focused and we we're going to show people the light of Christ kind of thing versus baptize, baptize, baptize. I think part of that is because he was sent in to do damage control for the church because the last mission president had gone a little too hard on the baptize to the point that where if you met a certain number of baptisms, there was 
a mission. It was like something like a mission fun day where you would gather the entire mission together and watch Pixar movies. And there would be like an ice cream truck and pizza and like this massive, <laughs> like a kiddie pool and like all the, all this, like pull out all the stops. And so it was like purely, anyways, um, he, the church, I think need to send in someone who was like very, who they knew that they could trust. Um, and he was very loving and, you know, very focused on, on the gospel teachings and, you know, personal conversion, which I, I, I appreciated. Um, and so the first area that why I was, it, ways everyone has that story that yeah. everyone that has gone through two mission presidents is usually one that's <laughs> one way. And then the next one There's is the super the opposite. strict high yeah. baptizing yeah. kind of mean mission president, <laughs> yeah. bunch of messes, low baptism quality, low retention. And then there's the cleanup, more loving focused kind of follow up missionary. I guarantee <laughs> the brethren are aware of this pattern and they, they've been doing it consciously. Cause I've, I've been hearing this since the nineties. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And it's how my mission was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's what, so your, yours was the cleanup, the cleanup <laughs> love group. guy. Yep. Yeah, after a disaster of a high yeah. baptizing, low retention. Yeah, <laughs> then numbers go down, and they gotta get another military guy to go. Yep, increase the baptism. Yeah. Gotta bring focus <laughs> yeah. back to the mission. It's gotten lazy, and let's yeah, let's be obedient. Let's baptize, elder. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, so my first area, I actually got my trainer was the AP of the mission. Um, so one AP trained me and then the other AP trained another one of the missionaries who arrived with me. And it was the four of us, um, in, you know, kind of the area next to the mission office. And I think, pr um, the president saw enough of me there that he's like, oh, you would make a good secretary. So I got, I spent one transfer in that area with the AP Then I went to a, another area on the very, very edge of the mission for three months. Um, that was really violent and really, um, just a really dark city, um, with like a lot of, a lot of, um, drug trafficking and violence. And so, you know, you know, stuff like heads floating in the river, things like that. Um, wow. Brazil's intense. You're it can not, be. You're not exaggerating. It can be. It's like, it, it really depends on, on the area. Like my first area next to the mission office, it's like, there's pets stores all over the place. There's like these really nice supermarkets with like supplements and things like that, like a very like up upscale area. And then, you know, got contrasted immediately after um, with that area, other area. Um, and so, but after that, so I have, I'm four months into the mission, I get called to the mission office as financial secretary. And that's where I would spend the next eight months. Um, and that taught me a lot about like, how the church views money and finances and things like that. I don't want to make assumptions, but like if I'm a Mormon mission president and I'm not super well educated about this stuff, one thing I'd be worried about was that you would have feelings for your companions. Like so, how, how would that not happen? <laughs> and so, but, and it may, that may or may not be true. But the other thing I would say is keeping you in the office is a way to keep an eye on you. If I'm, yeah. a, if I'm a mission president. I think, I don't think that's really what it was. I think what it was is my, my AP companion. Cause I told him about some, like we were, just, we were just chatting sometimes and he knew, figured out that I knew my way around a computer really well. Mm. And he knew that like, that would be really useful in the office. And he also saw how good my Portuguese was because, um, the way it kind of pushed down all the dissonance was just to really immerse myself in the language. So even though I'd only been out on, on, the mission for like four months, I was able to talk pretty fluently with people. And then by the at time of like, I was out of the mission office, like I could convince people with just the accent that I was native, but, um, okay. And so, um, yeah, it was, the mission office was interesting because the first companion that I had there, um, I actually, <laughs> so he was really, really bad. Um, he was from Colombia. He had, a lot of, you know, like the Hispanic, like machismo kind of going on um, and really did not like how feminine I was. And mm. 
he, so as missionaries, you leave a message with the families after you eat lunch with them. At, at least, you know, in our mission, that's what we did. And we would eat lunch with a different family every day. And we would leave messages, you know, like a gospel message. And he started consistently picking messages about the family. Being like, oh, eternal family is one of God's core principles. And, you know, marriage is between a man and a woman. And, you know, stuff like this where the, the families kind of agreed, you know, and it seemed fine, but I, I could tell he was targeting me specifically. Even though I hadn't come out to him or, or do anything I, or said anything to him, he, he kind of knew and started targeting me. And he would always do, like, attack me personally in front of the members. Mm. And so that he knew I couldn't respond angrily at him because you, you don't upset the members, right? That's the number one rule of the missionary. Um, as a missionary, is like you don't ruin the relationships with the members. And so he, would, he was really, like, manipulative, like, would gaslight me all the time um, to, like, like, oh, you didn't do that chore. I was like, yes, I did. He's like, go do it again. It's like that kind of stuff. Just constantly, constantly, like, very, like, abusive mentality. Um, and I was like, I can't deal with another transfer of this. I need to get out of here. Um, but I also, I also knew he was really good. He was very charismatic, very smiling, like, very good, like, smiley personality, good sense of humor. And so I wasn't sure if the mission president was actually going to believe me. Mm. Um, so what I did was I told my mission president I had a crush on him. <laughs> I was like, I know how to get this guy far away from me. I'm like, if I tell mission president I have a crush on him, then this problem's going to disappear. <laughs> and we'll never be companions again. Um, and it felt, I was like, maybe I should have just told him the truth, but like it wasn't a guarantee in the same way that this was. So that's what I told my mission president. And then sure enough, the next transfer, he was, you know, on the other side of the mission. So, um, and I kept working as financial secretary. <laughs> um, I've, how was it working with church finances on the mission? If there's anything you would like to share. It, I, I had, I was an AP, so I was close to secretaries and I know that there was some weird sketchy stuff happening, um, with general authorities in Mexico and things. So I didn't get anything like that that I was more just kind of blown away by, by the church's bureaucracy and how well it did what it was supposed to do and also disappointed in the ways that they structured it. So I guess as an example, um, there's not a single transaction that I could make as a financial secretary on behalf of the mission without it getting vetted by professional accountants in Sao Paulo um, who would look over every single expense that every mission was making and you know, have to sign off on it. And um, everything was like, like the books, the church's books are immaculate. Like everything is recorded. Everything is, they know exactly where all the money is going all the time. Um, and if something seems awry, you know, they'll come in and they'll, you know, they'll pressure you about it. And so it was a lot of pressure just because of that. Um, and I don't know, the one, the one incident that really sticks in my mind was these sisters that had gotten robbed um, in their area at gunpoint and had lost all their money. And it was an area where the uh, members, there weren't enough members to s consistently feed them. Um, and so they called the mission president and were like, we need money for groceries because we just got robbed. Um, and uh, the president was like, okay, well, Elder Smith, can you make this happen? I was like, did the thieves give them a receipt? Because Sao Paulo is not going to like that I don't have a receipt for this. And it took both of uh, me and my mission president calling Sao Paulo, um, the Sao Paulo headquarters um, for Brazil, and uh, going really far up the chain of like financial command in order to get grocery money for these sisters. Wow. And it's... It took a lot even after that. They're like, we had to go to the to the notary. Both president and I had to get our, our signatures notarized for this thing. And it was it was a huge hassle. Um, and the money still took a week for that to arrive in their accounts. And that kind of stuck with me. I was like, this is kind of where the church's priorities are. Because for everything else, you know, ordering materials, ordering Book of Mormons, ordering, you know, all this other stuff, um, it was very streamlined and very easy. But like for for getting the missionaries their money, it was Which is not that much, right? Like yeah. no. That's the other thing. It was, yeah. it was like, 
I don't know, it was 170 hey eyes. So it was like, I don't know what the exchange rate is now, but back then it was like one to four. So like, I don't know, like 40 US dollars yeah. to get them each yeah. for a sister, right? And like, I don't know, my pres president at a certain point was just so frustrated. He's like, can I just give them my credit card? I'm like, no, 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 you can't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know, it, it, it's just a lot of like, like I said, it shows you where the church's priorities are. Um, and then, yeah, it, 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 it's just also crazy to me that like, because I've since, since then looked at like what actual accountants do. And I was basically a full-time accountant plus a missionary. Yeah, well, bookkeeper. Kind yeah. Because yeah. I was paying all of the rent for all of the missionaries. I was paying the light bills. I was paying the water bills. I was paying, you know, and I was keeping track of all of this like, like an accountant had to. And so... How about the mission president's expenses? Did you keep track of those? All of those, yeah. How and is it seeing, did it cause any dissonance seeing how a mission president would spend money versus how missionaries are like giving so little? It would have if my mission president were a different man. Um, he was very, very frugal with the church money because he, he told us all the time. He told me all the time because sometimes we would have to, um, again, this also I think ties in with the last mission president who would spend all of this money for like, mission-wide parties and things like that if they met baptism goals. Um, but for him, it was like, this is some ladies, two mites, right? You mm. save all of this money as much as you can because it is sacred, it's very precious. And so he was very frugal about it. Um, and um, yeah. Now, sometimes that can translate to missionaries in the field not having enough food or not having enough so, like good mattresses, to, where to sleep. He, he didn't care. Well, he cared about that, but not as much as his wife did. His wife was like the one who would always come in and be like, <laughs> a lot of the times the sisters were, were scared to call the mission office for the materials they need because the elders wouldn't always um, be as willing yeah. to cooperate. So they'd call sister, uh, the you know, the wife, the wife and get her to come and be like, elder, you need to buy this, this and this for, for mm -hmm. these, um, missionaries. So it worked. I mean, at the, like I, I feel I, and also when we were looking at, at, um, different places for missionaries to rent, like we were, um, both mission president and his wife made sure that we were looking like safety was a number one priority and that they actually lived in, in good living places because um yeah i know that that's also like a kind of uh, something that people have experienced on their missions is like they live in like this absolute hole in the wall and like yeah. super violent community but um we really tried and like i tried a lot like there was a lot of hoops i had to jump through to make some of those things happen and uh, you know we jumped through them because you know it's, it's worth it so yeah that's good to hear yeah um I was, I was never in the office. I was always like opening areas, branch president, bab, you know, trying to do the baptism thing. And I always envied the office elders. It seemed like it would be, it's closer to the power, which I don't think at the time I thought that way, but I think instinctively I knew it's where the money is, it's where the decisions are, it's where the mission president is, it's where the power is. They had cars, they had better food, you know, uh, it just seemed, so, I mean, I'm wondering if you experienced it as like, yeah, I'm kind of lucky. I kind of have it good. Yeah, or were you hating I mean, it? a little bit. Or were um, you feeling the opposite? Were you feeling like I'm a slacker? I should be out in the field. Like what, what was it like being an office elder, especially given your context? Yeah. So I guess for me, I felt really useful for like the first time in my life because I was doing like I knew how to code a little bit. So I, instead of, I set up, I made it way easier for every financial secretary who came after me. And I know that for a fact, um, because I automated a lot of the processes that were, you know, taking a long time, like paying each individual light bill. Like some of it had started to be automated, but like I was one of the people who went through and because I knew how to do a little bit of coding and some stuff in Excel, um, I managed to like make, the whole thing a lot easier and make it run more efficiently. And so I, I felt like I was being really useful. Um, and, you know, you get to see, you know, the, the effects of that work pretty in both a positive and a negative way. If you forget to some, pay someone's light bill, you better believe you're going to get a call and they will let you know. Um, and so um, 
yeah, just all of that. I felt like I was being useful. There was a little bit of like, after working, because we worked from seven to five every day. Um, and then we were supposed to go out and proselyte for another five hours. And it's crazy. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and I, there, was, there were multiple t occasions where like, because we would also have to walk an hour to get to our area from the mission office. Because the mission office was technically like another area. And so there were some, there were some nights where like our, me and my companion would just look at each other and we'd be like, it's not happening tonight. Like we are not making it to our area. And we would feel bad about that. Um, like pretty consistently. Um, but I mean, it's like, what, what were you going to do? Like we had a bunch of work and needed to stay late in the office. Like couldn't really do anything about it. So. Okay. All right. So mix maybe. Yeah. And then we also didn't get to drive even though we were in the office because no one in Brazil drives or none of the missionaries do anyways. So yeah. All right, so how how did things develop in advance for you? So after the mission office, I went to um, a couple of other areas. Um, and I don't know. So at that point, I kind of, the mission office was good because I could really just focus on the good I was doing for the other missionaries and not worry as much about like the gospel principles um, that were causing a lot of conflict for me. But once I got back into like the field, it started really, you know, there, the dissonance was hitting really hard because I knew at this point that I was going to probably leave the church at some point um, mm. because I, the thing that I, because I, I would pray about this all the time. I would, I was really trying to seek personal revelation about what God wanted me to do, right? And I, I got to the point where I was like, if God gives me an answer that is contrary to the church, I don't care at this point because it's my personal revelation and no one else can tell me what to do with it. Um, so I was praying really hard for several months um, trying to get an answer to, um, you know, what should I do about this whole gay thing? Um, and I don't know, I would, I would talk, I got to the point where I, I started talking about it with like pretty much all of my companions. Um, just to see what, if anyone, I was so desperate for anyone to have an answer that I, I hadn't already thought of, or like some miracle, like, oh, how, I, how, I had, how had I missed that kind of thing? Um, and uh, yeah, it just got to the point where it really depended on the mission companion, how well I, I was gonna do in that area. Um, if the companion was kind of more homophobic, then I was gonna do poorly. If they weren't, then I was gonna do well. Um, at this point, I, would, I also want to say, like, I don't know, God bless the Brazilians, just because, I don't know, it might have just been the batch of, that I got, but I, all of my Brazilian companions were way more understanding than any of the other companions I got on the mission. Mm. I think part of that is just because of the culture in Brazil. It's a lot more loose um, when it comes to stuff with sex. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think the best friendships I made out of any of them, uh, out of any of the people on the mission were, were all Brazilians. And so... Um, really grateful to them. I also just really grateful for the people in Brazil, um, and you know all the all the love that they showed me and all, all of that. I'm just it's uh, it's thinking back on it. I'm still just kind of kind of floored, and I don't know. I, I really want to go back at, at some point. Um, but so I guess the last kind of mission companion I had. Um, was, how how long? How many months into your time in Brazil? Are we now in your so, story? Mission, so I get go to the mission office with four months on the mission, and then I leave the mission um, office after eight months. So I'm a year and two months on the mission. Okay. And then I have a couple of transfers that you know go pretty well because the I got a good back, a good couple set of companions. And um, did you come out to any of them? Yeah, I came out to, to pretty okay. much everyone at this point. Um, Even though your mission president told you not to. Yeah, because it it was tearing me up so much. Yeah. I was like. They could see that I was like visibly upset most of the time. Like, um, can you talk about? And I, it's going to be varied with depending on who you came out to. But like, responses? I'm sure there's yeah. a lot of people thinking, "What's it like in 20 whatever to come out to your Mormon?" So I could I could give you a rundown. Day. So um, <laughs> the first 
couple of companions I had before going into the mission office, two Brazilians um, who I came out to. We're pretty Did you have to learn the word for gay in Brazilian? It's just it's just gay in, in Portuguese. It's just gay. Okay. In Brazilian. I mean, in Guatemala. I'm sorry. In Portuguese. <laughs> in Guatemala, there was a word for butterfly that was used, but I think it was oh, a pejorative. Okay, so it's I think there was a pejorative, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Same so they, they I, have I that. They have that too, to but it's the word the, for it's the word for deer. Okay. Um, and it is it's it's pejorative. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you you have to find the right word, and you wouldn't learn that growing up. Yeah, well, I would just say gay, and they would normally understand. Because I did okay. look it up before I went on the mission. I was like, <laughs> how do I how do I not botch this? Um, and so I came out to a couple of Brazilians. One of them I felt was, I love this guy so much. Um, he was on the mission as like a 25-year-old, twenty maybe even 26. He's like, I put in my papers on the last day mm. possible. And his, his life story was basically that he was making a bunch of money, and spent it all on, you know, whatever party he could go to in Sao Paulo because he lived in downtown Sao Paulo, which is like this massive city. Um, so he's like, yeah, dude, I've tried. He, he had a bunch of tattoos and was like, I've tried every single drug you can possibly imagine. And he's like, I was like, he had like a come to Jesus moment when he woke up in like, yeah, it was just like totally like, I don't know, didn't remember anything that had happened like for the past three or four days. And He's like, maybe I need to find God. And that's how he joined the church and then went on a mission. Um, and so, I don't know, I felt comfortable telling him because it was like he'd probably already seen this kind of stuff before. Yeah. And he was just a very chill guy. I love him so much. Um, and we got along very well. And um, other Brazilian companion. What would they say? Just like, oh, that, that's cool. Yeah, it's like, ah. Oh. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, dude. Like... <laughs> It's, it's whatever. Um, Did any of them say they admired you for being in the church and for doing what you're doing? Some of them were just like, yeah, dude, I don't know why you're here. Like, <laughs> mm. that exact kind of tone, like, I don't know why you're here, but, you know, kudos, man. Like, good luck. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had a couple who were like, yeah, dude, you know, during Carnival, after a lot of alcohol, you know, I might be a little bit gay, too. It's okay. <laughs> like... <laughs> 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 And these are the Brazilians. Yeah, these are <laughs> Brazilians. Yeah, because um, a lot—I don't know—a lot of the Brazilians have like these really interesting life stories before they come on the mission. Mm. Um, it's a very different culture than like the the U.S., where it's like you have to be, you know, pure. In Murray, for, Utah. Well, yeah. well, where it's like I don't know. I it kind of surprised me when I got back from my mission to hear like people who broke the law of chastity with their girlfriend like a year before their mission couldn't go. I was like, I know a guy who the bishop walked in on his house for a home teaching appointment the day before he was supposed to go on his mission. And he was there like in the middle of the, of the act with the, with the girl. And like, Bishop was just like, dude, you need to go on the mission. I can't deal with this anymore. Like, <laughs> get out of Different my ward, rules, get out of my ward. Like, Bishop kind of thing. Real. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so, I don't know, it's just a very different mentality. And so, I, I don't know, there were, a couple of Americans, though, um, who kind of grew up in, in the different culture, um, and not even like the East, because I was used to like the East Coast kind of, um, you know, way that we would talk about it. Because people in my ward even were, were supportive of me coming out, mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. I want to give them a lot of credit for that. Um, like my ward was never somewhere where I felt like I was going to experience a lot of homophobia. Um, so one of the people I came out to on a mission was an elder who told me that as good as my arguments were for gay marriage and that it should be legal, I should watch Ben Shapiro to see how <laughs> to actually argue about this. <laughs> and <laughs> and that was like, okay, maybe president was right. Maybe I should <laughs> tell everyone about this. Um, and uh, yeah, but so that, that was one response I got and then yeah, I don't know, coming out to everyone else on the mission, most of them were like very kind of okay about it. Like they could understand. Some of them really wanted to know more like about the like the doctrine behind it. And like, because mm. they, they started, I think it started clicking where they're like, wait, this isn't right. Like I need to know more about this so I can actually see if there's, mm. if this is a shelf item for me or not. Like if this is something I'm going to have to tuck away in the corner of, and kind of forget about to keep my testimony. And so, um, yeah. Um, but yeah, so this last elder, um, I was about 18 months on my mission. Um, 
And again, he's like a very nice guy. He, the thing I remember the most about him is that he would wash the dishes every single time after we ate at, you know, a member's house, which is something I had not seen anyone else do. Um, because I don't know, normally when you're there, it's like the, the members are trying to do everything to help you. And, they, and a lot of them would try not to let him wash the dishes. Like, no, you're our guest. And he's like, no, I'm going to do this. Um, and so very kind hearted and like genuinely cared about all the people that we were teaching. And it really stung when I came out to him and it wasn't the response I was expect expecting. Um, as soon as, as soon as like the day after I came out to him, it started like every single day while we were walking from, from appointment to appointment, you do a lot of walking. And so it's a lot of time just to talk. Um, we would debate back and forth about, well, what is God's purpose? You know, God's purpose is, and you know, what is a bird's purpose? Like, what is a man and a woman's purpose kind of thing? And like asking me all these kind of leading questions to try and get me to say a certain thing, right? It's like, and I think it was his way of trying to like help me resolve my, my, my doctrinal doubts and um, reconcile things, but it just made things worse. Cause I'm like, I've already been down this rodeo and the way you're doing it is very condescending. I didn't tell him this at the time, but I was just like, eh, I don't think this is working. Um, until it got to the point where it was like, um, I kind of went, I kind of would just laid it all out for him. I'm like, I could either be celibate, I could do a mixed orientation marriage. That's probably going to fall apart statistically, or I can, date people and try and get married and have my own family that way. And it's still going to be difficult, but it's going to be, you know, doable um, because I'm going to be with someone I love. And then he kind of said to me, he, he sat there for a second thinking about it. And he's like, you know, I understand how much this means to you and all these arguments that you have. But at the end of the day, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to look at that. I don't think God's ever gonna be, going to be able to look at a, at a man in a relationship with a, another man as anything different than like a man with a horse kind of thing. Cool. And I was just floored by that. And I was just like, okay, we're done. Let's go home. Like we're, we're just going home. I'm, we're done teaching for today. Cause I, I just, I just had it. And it made, it made so much sense in, in retrospect to look back at some of the other things, like some of the other elders had said to me and be like, oh, they were looking at me as a horse kind of thing, or like a, as like some sexual pervert, um, rather than like an actual, like they, they, they didn't see the type of love that I saw, right? Like I, when I was talking about like gay love, I was talking about wanting to hold hands with this guy. I was talking about wanting to like hug him and, you know, start a family and have share that. Share your life. Yeah, share yeah. Your dreams, yeah. your hopes. Right. And they were just seeing this as you are a sexual pervert with a weird fetish. Bestiality. Kind of thing. Yeah. They're, they're seeing yeah. bestiality. Yeah. And that <clears throat> kind of, when it kind of said in like all these different things, I'm like, oh, if you actually saw it this way, maybe you wouldn't want this to be legalized kind of thing. And like, I started realizing that a lot of these arguments kind of were just, you know, personal attacks on me or, 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 or what they thought of as gay people rather than like actually trying to understand me. Um, and when that started setting in retroactively and the dominoes kind of started falling, I was just like, okay, I, I'm in a bad spot now. Um, and I had been praying this whole time. I've been trying to be super righteous. I was a zone leader at this point too. Um, like I was doing everything that I could. Um, and it still wasn't enough. Um, were there, were there ever any companions? One of the reactions I probably would have had as a probably homophobic Mormon missionary, but one of the reactions I think many would expect would be companions that would say, hey, don't you get any ideas with me? You know, I'm like, I, are you gonna like me? Are you gonna be looking at me? You know, the, looking at me, like that type of reaction. Uh, I, I there just, were a couple who were kind of like that, but once I saw that I, it, I wasn't like that, that kind of, you know, okay, just dissipated. There were a couple of Brazilians who you're like, oh, so which elder do you think is the hottest then? <laughs> <laughs> like, they're like, if you have to pick one, <laughs> pick one to marry, you know, <laughs> pick an elder. Like, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> kind of like a girlfriend, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like a gay, like a gay guy's girlfriend, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, being fun with it. 
Yeah, having yeah. fun with it. Oh, fun. Um, okay, but you never felt like mm, someone was hostile or even violent? No, not really. You? Not really. Okay. Thankfully. Okay. Um, yeah, and okay. so... Sorry, back to the elder. Yeah, and, and at that point, we were at going in this area, and I was really living two different lives just because there was, like, the life I had in my head and the life I was showing to everyone else. And I was putting on this happy, you know, missionary kind of with a testimony act to all the people who were teaching, all the members. And then in my head, I was just like tearing myself apart because um, I just didn't, I, I, I felt like I needed to stay on the mission, but I also knew I needed to go home because of, I was like, the, the suicidal thoughts started coming back at that point, And I was feeling so trapped that like, I don't know if my companion ever even noticed this, but there was this one bridge that we would have to walk over, this like overpass that went over a highway. And every single time we walked over that overpass, starting at a certain point, it I would have to walk on the inside of the road just to like keep myself from doing anything. Um, and it, it just, I tried so hard to do like the love thing and have that be my reason for the staying on the mission. Be like, I love the people here. They need to know this. They need to hear this and they need, they need to, you know, need the gospel. And then just the more that the, I started really examining things, the more I'm like, this is just not true. This isn't the reason I'm here. I'm here because of, you know, just because I'm kind of trapped here at this point. Like I, I, because I need to be Mormon to like keep people at home happy. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's. I, I, I've, that overpass still is just, for me, it's just, I can picture it so clearly and exactly like, I it was only like one foot of, of clearance between like, they don't have like the massive like fence that they have in like overpasses. Um, a lot of places, places in the US, it was just like one foot, it was like it could be so easy. Um, and yeah, I just, yeah, it, it was, it, I started realizing like, I, I need to go home. like. Cause I, I knew what my limit was from, from high school. I was like, I know how far I can, how far I can push the misery before I start to break. And you, I was, I was reaching my limit. That's what you promised me before you left. Yeah. He promised me, I told him I would check every week with him. I would ask him the same question. How, how are you doing in mental health wise? And he would tell me. And I, I mean, said, your mom, she, she had that motherly instinct before yeah. you ever left, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and on the, the entirety of the mission, she kept telling me just to come home. Because I think I would say certain things in the emails, and she was probably the only one who actually knew, like, all the stuff I wasn't saying. Yeah. Because um, she had also been in a lot of those places before. Um, it was funny because he would actually write to me and his seminary teacher, who's, like, a, one of our best, closest family friends, very progressive and very just a great guy and um to his aunt that he came out to first and he would tell us the three of us the bad stuff like the hard stuff that he didn't want to necessarily tell cheryl um but cheryl read between the lines on everything else and she knew how hard things were for him and um yeah it was uh it was an interesting time as a parent to to feel such worry over your son who's thousands of miles away and you can't even talk to him. I was, it was before the calls weekly. It was just, we were just exchanging emails. So you could only talk by phone to your parents. How frequent? Um, God, what's the name of this in English? Mother's Gia Day? Desmai. Yeah. <laughs> Mother's Day and uh, Christmas. So twice, you could call home twice a year, Mother's Day yeah. and Christmas. Yeah. yeah. And do you think um, you had any idea, Evan, of... So how bad it was actually, actually at the very, a couple of weeks before I came home, that's when the policy was instituted. Oh, um, that you could call that you could call. Yeah. And I remember I, I was the zone leader. Right. And I got a call from the AP being like, you need to tell this to your zone. I'm like, haha, very funny. And I hung up on him. <laughs> I was like funny prank dude. Like, hung, cause we had a, we had a good relationship and he called me back. He's like, I'm serious, man. Like, you can call home. <laughs> you can call. He's like, you have to tell the rest of your missionaries that they can, you know, actually call home this week or like, you know, video chat. And so, um, we video chatted with Wes for those, for like the last month of his mission. And every time it was almost like 
hard to find a place where you could tell us how you were really feeling because your yeah. companion was like right next to you. Yeah. And it's like you can't really be honest about what's, yeah. Yeah, but also it's in, in Brazil, you're in public at an internet cafe. Yeah. And people are already looking at you weird because you're speaking English and like this tiny little, you're in the middle of the favela and no one speaks any other languages except Portuguese. Um, and so, yeah, it was just, uh, it, it was an interesting experience to do that. But every single time my mom told me, she's like, you know, just come home, just come home it over and over again. So like if you're having tr problems with your companion, if your companion is being abusive, you can't tell your parents because your, right. your companion is right, right next there. to you right. listening. Well, I, sometimes we like I, sometimes I, I could complain about them because they didn't speak English. Yeah, and, <laughs> but it, it was like you, that was the only way you could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. hard. Tell them about that thing. I, so I, I was blown away with um, an email you sent one time about the proclamation. Yeah. Um, so blown away, I actually incorporated it into my book about what the proclamation. Actually honestly, says. I've I've kind of forgotten the exact realization I had about it, but. Um, Basically, I, I, there's this one talk, because I started dreading, like, like you were saying earlier, I started dreading every single general conference, just because I knew that they were going to, you know, President Oaks was going to get up there and say something that made me have, you know, made me, like, question everything for the next six months. Um, until he said something else, I made me question something different for the next six months. And I think this time it was Elder Anderson who got up and gave a talk about and talked a ton about the, the a family of proclamation to the world. Um, and I was like, you know what? They keep bringing this up. Let's go home and study this. Like, that's just, I'm going to study this in English. I'm going to study this in Portuguese. I'm going to study this in French because I learned how to read French on the mission too. Um, and so I was like, I'm going to study this in all three languages. I'm going to see if there's anything like here that like, um, you know, doesn't line up with what they're saying. And I, I forget what the exact, I'd have to look at the exact wording again to see what the, and like look at my journal to see what the exact realization I had. But it was something along the lines of, um, even though it says marriage is ordained between a man and a woman, the rest of it, it doesn't necessarily say that like gay marriage is, is it doesn't condemn gay marriage, right? It just says, you know, this is how marriage, this is a way that marriage is ordained of God. Not the only way. It's not the only way. And so... Right. Same with sex, right? It says sexual, it, it, it doesn't say sexual relations are only between man and woman. It says the power of procreation is only between man and woman. And gay sex isn't procreating. So it's like you can read the <laughs> proclamation literally. Yeah. And it doesn't prohibit gay marriage. Yeah. And so when I, I was blown away, I was like, whoa, wow. <laughs> yeah. So when I had that realization, I was like, so they're using this. It was more, it was also kind of just like, okay, so the church is just being homophobic because they're being homophobic and they don't want me here. Um, combine that with what the elder had, like that was, I think that was the same week that the elder had said that thing about the horse to me. And I was just like, okay. I had this real, at the time I was like, the most powerful spiritual experience that I, I, I'd ever had. Again, looking back, I'm like, I don't know if I would use the word spiritual, but it was just this overwhelming confirmation. Cause like I got on my knees and I, I asked God, I said, you know, if I, if I do date, if I do get married, if I do, you know, foster kids, I promise I will do the best job that I possibly can to do it as righteously as I can. And these kids will be good people and I'll marry a good man and I'll be a good man for, for this family. And I, I promised that to, to God. And after reading the proclamation that in that way, I felt this overwhelming sensation that um, and I, I just started crying, crying, crying. And, and it, it was like tears of joy at being like, yes, that's okay. Like, why wouldn't that be okay? Um, and so all of that combined, um, combined with like the already the, the mental health stuff that was going on, I was like, okay, I'm going home now. Um, so th at this point, you know, I told my mission president about this, and then this is where we had a couple of the conversations where I'm kind of like, okay, he just was not equipped to deal with what I was dealing with. Um, we started talking, I, I'd asked him a bit about my patriarchal blessing, because my patriarchal blessing says that I'm going to marry a woman. And it came up, and he used, so knowing I was from, you know, from Boston, he used the analogy of, of the Super Bowl. Um, where the Patriots were losing 28 to three 
and he said, um, you know, if you looked at the final score of that game and saw that the Patriots won, there was no way that you were going to believe that. But they did. And so it's like your patriarchal blessing is a final score, and you have to believe that, you know, you're going, you're going to marry a woman. That's going to happen, even though you have no idea how it's going to happen, how the comeback's going to happen. <laughs> and that was not super helpful for me. Um, <laughs> and then when I got... When I, when I told him I wanted to go home, he kind of was just like, you know, how much are you talking to your parents about this? I was like, well, I talk to them every week now because of the policy change. He's like, well, maybe you should, you know, cut back on that if they're telling you that you need to go home. Mm. Ooh. And I was like, I'm sorry, no. Like, that's not going to happen. Like, I, I, I've, like I'm not going to, like, not listen to my parents over this. Like, I, I, I'm sorry. Like, that's just not going to happen. It just um, isn't cool, right? I mean, you're talking about the mental health of a child on the other side of the world, and you're trying to keep him alive, and you have someone in the church who's a loving, kind guy, well-intentioned, but giving advice that's going to cause further trauma and harm, and just very risky to do that. And as a, as a dad, I was, I was pissed. I don't I think I don't think he realized how much mental health stuff I was going no, through. No, I, I know. I, I, um, yeah. But to be fair to him, but um, yeah, I that's. Kind of where, at that point, I got I got put on a plane and came home. So, so he didn't just openly resist. No, he he was very sad, like very very like disheartened and like I don't know. Every time I saw him after that, he was he was like you know I'm I'm letting you go and he he like he made it clear how much he loved me. Um, and he didn't ever say like you know I'm disappointed in you or whatever, but he was you could tell from his body language that he was just like really distraught. So. And you had gone on a mission to redeem yourself, so I'm just wondering. And even though you feel like you're doing the right thing by leaving, how could you also not feel like you're failing again? And I don't mean to be planting that because maybe you didn't feel that way, but I guess that is a question. If I hadn't gotten that confirmation, that overwhelming confirmation, yeah. right? That to me was at the time I was like, this is my personal revelation from God, right? Um, now I think it's just I have different opinions about all of these like spiritual experiences, but anyways, it's can, can I just say, and Gerardo, I don't know if I've ever told you this. So my dissertation for my PhD, we surveyed 1,612 LGBTQ Mormons, and <clears throat> one of the questions we asked them was, "Did you ever get to have a spiritual experience affirming your same-sex sexuality?" And something crazy like 45 to 50% of them did receive a spiritual experience supporting or affirming their same-sex sexuality. Yeah. And they wrote these beautiful narratives about mm -hmm. they were in the desert, had a gun, they were ready to end it all, and then a, a, a spirit descended. How could it be any different than what Joseph Smith claimed? Yeah, yeah Some that, sort of that's spirit. really what I, that's, I wrote. I remember like using the language like that and when writing about it because like this is – such an overwhelming experience for me. And that buoyed you. Yeah. And it, it finally let me see the church for like, okay, I'm like, this is not my religion anymore. Like I don't need this anymore. Um, mm. um yeah, and I, I when he when he shared it with with me like that, I thought and, and told told him that I probably used the, the wrong case from scripture. I should have used a different one, but I said, you know how Nephi broke a commandment because he was prompted to and he was told to kill Laban, like it's a bad example, but still I was like, there can be, there's scriptural examples, Adam and Eve, for example, they broke a commandment because it was, you know, what God wanted anyway. There's times when you do something against the church, against, against the rules, against the commandments, because it's actually the right thing to do. It's the best thing to do. Um, and again, that Nephi example is a really horrible one. It's not a good, good example, but I, I, I was telling, trying to communicate to Wes that like, look, I support you. You don't need, like, even from the church perspective, there's rationale for being, outside the church because it's what you need to do and that's what God's telling you to do. Yeah. I was a hundred percent like, that's what God is telling you to do. I believed his revelation. Yeah. And I so, said, yeah. And so if, I was going to say Holy ghost for the win. Yeah. And uh, so glad you had the parents you had because there's the Mormon teaching that a spirit can be of God or a spirit can be of the devil that can deceive you into making you think that that spirit is of God. Yeah. And so if you had the wrong parents or the wrong leaders, 
They very well could have tried at to. At that point, though, I was wouldn't have worked. I, it <laughs> was no, it was such an overwhelming experience. Mm. I, I could not have been convinced otherwise. That's I awesome. was like, yay, yeah. And so I was like, you know what? You know, I've got my own God at this point. It's like it's just me and Him. And I, I had the confirmation that like if I kept living my life the way I had been, and really honestly trying, that like He was going to be fine with the end result. You know. And so I didn't need to worry about any of the like specific commandments or anything. And I think, honestly, that's still to an extent like what I believe. Like if, if there is a God and, and, you know, an afterlife and there is a final judgment, like I'm going to say like, look, I did everything exactly to the best that I could. And if you want to judge me for that, then like that's on you at this point, at that point. Right. Um, and um, yeah, so it was honestly coming home didn't really feel like I didn't get the traditional like Mormon missionary comes home early experience. I got, you know, welcomed with open arms and because most of my extended family also was kind of on their way out at that point. Um, well, yeah, most of her, most of Cheryl's yeah. Cheryl's family was kind of on the way out. Um, and yeah, and yeah, and so I don't know. I had a lot of people there to support me. And again, growing up in in, in this ward, um, they were very supportive. And so I didn't really face a lot of the like fallout um that you might have if you had come home early like under under different circumstances i was in the stake president scene had conversations with the stake president obviously about it and um he's a good guy and felt strongly that west should have a re- regular homecoming not a homecoming of shame and so he actually gave a report to the high council like all missionaries do when, mm. they, when they come home yeah he spoke in church did gave a homecoming talk like the whole i think thing. that's the so. last sacrament meeting i ever went to was my homecoming talk yeah. and after that i was just like i'm done and I, I literally did not want to hear anyone say anything about the church for like the next two years. Cause I was so, there were so many other things I needed to process too at that point. And that's when I finally started doing therapy and, and all that stuff. So, um, and then eventually, you know, a couple of years later, here I am. And I finally am like willing to talk about it and write the book and all this stuff. So in a good place. Yeah. Finally. So how many years ago were you coming home from your mission? Four now. Or yeah, okay. 20, 2019. 2019. Before wow. or after the three. reversal of the policy? Uh, April, he came, April was the reversal. He came home in May, May of 2019. So after. So right, right. after. Yeah, right after the November 2015 policy got reversed. Yep. That didn't, the reversal didn't fix it all for you? I honestly didn't even know what had happened. Mm. I don't, I don't think. Yeah. I don't think it was on my radar. Because I was so, it's different when you're like in the moment, like teaching people about the gospel every day, like the, mm. the fundamentals of the gospel, right? If you're giving a lesson about Joseph Smith every single day, you know, the policy doesn't matter as much. It's like, do I believe in Joseph Smith and all this other, th- all these other things? It's like, and I, that, at that point, I, that's kind of when the rest of it kind of fell apart where I'm like, I don't believe in the fundamental organization of the church anymore. So. Man, I have to ask you, this is a hard question. It's a hard question for me. Like my notion of spirituality is so tainted because now I associate all these teachings about the Holy Ghost and warm fuzzies and prayer with the conditioning of a high demand religion, such that like I have a tendency personally not to evangelize this, but just personally to say, you can't trust any of that. Like that's all conditioning. That's all hooey, hocus pocus, um, woo. And it's just chemicals and electrical impulses and so. that's what's going on. <laughs> then you tell me about your experience and there's no, there's no profit. There's no like, you know, there's no charlatan that's, or, or rich, wealthy corporation that's manipulating you. You have, and it's, there's not even any source of a church or anything. You just have this theophany, I'll call it, when you shouldn't be having it. And it like feels real and it's meaningful. And it is transformative. And every yeah. time I'm trying, like, yeah, but it, surely it was hard here and there. You're like, nope, I knew from that point on. I knew that I'm just like, what the freak was that? Like, was I that it, was I that like was... the divine? Was that the gay Holy Ghost? Was that the real Holy Ghost? Like, <laughs> no, so, what so was looking, that? looking back at it, <laughs> looking, I, I like love the, that. The I, like the, I like the gay Holy Ghost though. <laughs> yeah, um, I think looking back at it, it was just years and years of me. 
doing constant battle with myself, right? It's like, am I a loser? Am I like sinful? Am I enough, right? And finally realizing that like, I didn't have a reason to hate myself the way I thought I did. Once that really sunk in, um, in that moment, it changed, it changes everything, right? It, it actually gave me self-esteem for the first time really my entire life. Um, and that totally changes how you act as a person, right? When you think that your life is worth something versus, you know, I'm only here because I don't want people to have to attend my funeral. Um, it changes everything. And so I was like, if my life is worth something, I'm not, I'm sure as hell I'm not going to be spending it teaching people things that they, I don't believe in. Like I, I was willing to do that if it meant that I, I could get some self-esteem out of it. But now that I have that, it's like, what am I doing? Like I, my time is worth more than this, right? Like I'm, I'm going to go home and my mental health is worth more than this. Like I'm a, I'm a valuable person. Um, Dang. and so that, that's kind of what it was for me, I think, looking back at it. And it's the same, it's interesting because every single time I felt like the spirit in my life, it's been someone telling me that my life is valuable and that my life is worth living. Um, and so when my mission president would tell me these things, right? Um, or, or tell me about the, the love of the atonement and that, you know, my life had so much value to Christ, I would feel like warm, the warm fuzzies, you know? And I attribute that to the spirit. Or when I was in, you know, hospital scrubs, crying in my brother's bed, ask, like praying to God and having that like internal realization that like my life was worth something. Again, the warm fuzzies and, and I attribute it to the spirit. And I don't know, I think, I don't know if, it, if it's my consciousness. I don't know what it is. I, I've stopped asking what it is because it doesn't matter at this point to me. Um, it's just, it's, it's just the, like the intrinsic value of human life to me. That's what I was going to say. I was going to say, I wonder if it's instinct. Like, the, you know, we've evolved for millions and millions of years and the things that make us feel the need to continue living or the need to bond together as a society or as humans and, and, and relate to each other. And that all is very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. I think those emotions are real and they can really be revelatory in a, in a real way. Yeah. So. So, and I wasn't necessarily fishing for any right answer, but it sounds like what you're saying is you, you have not interpreted those experiences as literally some, some higher power sending some divine messenger or his own higher power to enlighten and save and strengthen and redeem you. I think it, you if have there is a, a higher power you know, like a loving higher power, like, like, a, you know, some sort of God, then he would do those things. Cause he, you know, you know, they would care about whatever, you know, all of their creations. But, um, at this point, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's God. I don't have the evidence. Like I don't, I, I don't have any way of figuring out what's going on. I just, I don't know. It, it's weird. Cause I, I'm very kind of just agnostic at this point where it's like, I don't know what's going on. I don't, I just know that I need to live the best life I can and I know what that looks like for me. And so I don't like, why do I need to know if there's a God or not? Like I, I, I can, I'm totally fine just letting it be an unknown and figuring that out, you know, when I die or whenever. So, yeah. So right now for you, that was just your brain. It was just your soul. You, it was maybe my brain. Maybe it was God. Like, I don't know. You don't I just, to. I just know that how it felt and, um, and you're following it. You're going I'm following it. it. And I know that like, yeah. If it was God, then God's going to be happy that I'm following it. If it's not God, you know, it's still a positive direction for me to go. So Beautiful. don't need to question it too much, I guess. So. Beautiful. Yep. Yeah. What a happy ending to a mission that wasn't looking so good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm really grateful that, you know, things ended up how they did. Um, and again, I want to give a lot of credit to my parents for, especially my mom, right? Because especially your mom. Yeah. You know, well, well, she might have missed a lot of the stuff in high school. I think on the mission, she was really the one who, yeah, who, who, you know, saved me. So she's a great example of when you know better, do better. And it was like, I know I have a gay kid, and I'm going to do whatever I can to get him into a good, healthy place and having a happy life. And she was committed to that. 
pushing back against me because I was still kind of at the church frame of mind in some ways, even though I was very still supportive as I could be with Wes, I still had the believing frame set, you know, mindset on. So Cheryl, yeah, Cheryl was yeah. amazing. Shout out to you, Cheryl. Nice work. Yeah. Yeah. And you stake presidency dad, like doesn't hurt to have to know that even though your dad is at some of the highest levels of church leadership, that he's got your back. That, that doesn't suck. Yeah, there was, um, cause not all stake presidency, Mormon dads, are going to react that way. Yeah. Many are going to say, you're embarrassing me. You know, you're a yeah. disappointment. Yeah. There's, yeah. I mean, in hindsight, I wish I would have, I wish I would have said what Cheryl said, which is please don't, don't go on a mission. Instead of saying you can, if you want, you don't have, instead of saying you don't have to Wes, I, I wish I would have said, this is a really bad idea for you. Um, the church is not healthy for you. And I, I regret that I'm, that he experienced 19 months of trauma, more trauma from the church than, he had already had. So I, I'm, I thank you for saying nice things, but I still kind of beat myself up for not being more understanding of what my son needed in his life for his happiness earlier than I did. And, and something I will say is that a lot of the trauma I went through wasn't necessarily even unique to me being gay. It's like, I think there's a lot of trauma that every single missionary goes through. Oh yeah. And it's just not labeled as that. Like if, I don't know, if you look at it a certain way, it's like, a lot of mission, Mormon missionaries are could be considered like human trafficking victims almost, where it's like they're doing this labor that like, you know, they're, they've are they been really pressured into and they didn't have much of a choice to, to, to say no. And I mean, I was in the mission office. I locked up people's passports, like, so they couldn't leave. And, it, you know, when I tried to leave, like I, my obviously my mission president didn't push very hard and he was very sympathetic with me, but there was still that kind of instinct to like, no, you have to stay here. Um, and so I don't know. I think, I think people really need to examine like the institution of, of the mission, um, within the church and call trauma for what it is, right? We're not, it shouldn't be an apt comparison that going to the mission is going to war, right? Cause war veterans have PTSD. They have all of these other things. And the fact that that resonates with so many people is, is, should be alarming and not, you know, we kind of pat ourselves on the back for that. I feel like sometimes. It's the Lord's army. Yeah, the Lord's army. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I've said this before, and I may say it every episode. Like, just like with women, how in 2022 somehow five million Mormons are still okay, including the women, with women being second class citizens, and it's just like, oh yeah, that's how we do things. Yeah. Like corporate America could never do that. Like no way. Like school districts couldn't do that. Like pick any organization, most other churches, totally unacceptable. Like the women, Mormon women are okay with it more than the Mormon men are. Like it's just this, and it's the same thing with LGBT stuff. Like it'd be, you know, I would say stop the presses if one kid died by suicide. And yet you literally have thousands, tens of thousands. Yeah. And like, we're all just like, yeah, but that's the Lord in his due time. You know, whether it's believing the homophobic LGBT stuff, which is most Mormons, or like you, it's like, well, this is going to change someday. So I'm going to stay in and fight from within, which I'm not judging people who fight from within. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not saying that's bad or wrong. But there's something about the permissibility of LGBT, of constant, chronic, continual, reliable LGBT, LGBT de deaths. Yeah. There's something about just like the longstanding recurring, repeating, um, genocide that somehow we're just all numb to. Yeah. And yeah. it's just, yeah, but you know, we'll figure it out. It'll, the, the church will get better. Okay. You know, even, even ex Mormons will be like, ah, you know, the church is 20 to 30 years behind the times. Ha 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 ha. But like that, th that's, this is serious. It's serious. And everybody's just kind of like dead to it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I don't know, the lack of urgency <clears throat> really upsets me. And I think a lot of people, you know, the word suicide at this point and like mental health has become such a kind of cliche that that's part of also why I, I wanted to write about this it's because it's like, it's one thing to say, oh, you know, there's a bunch of kids who are suicidal. It's a different to put it in the context of like, there are kids who are like me 
that are actively imagining the type of casket their parents are going to pick out for them. Or who think that their parents are going to get to give them their eulogies. And who there are kids who imagine this every single day because of how the church is treating them or because of how their parents are treating them and for any number of reasons. But if, if you put it in that context, right, and you imagine either, you know, your parents or your, or your children or whatever, it suddenly becomes a lot more urgent, right? Yeah. It's... <sighs> we, we need to do better at, 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 at recognizing that. And it's, it really makes me angry that, that people continue just to, to write it off. When, when that's the reality of the situation. Yeah, and I, I think change is going to come, but it's going to be decades from now, and it is, that's way too late. Way too many lives will be lost between now and then. And that's, you know, I said it in the first part of, of this uh, podcast, but the, I, that's one of the reasons I changed my mind about discussing more transparently the conversations I have with general authorities on this as a state presidency member. I just, we need to start having full open conversations. Like I, I want the general authorities to sit in a room with someone like Kyle Ashworth, somebody, and just take questions. So, like there needs to be open public conversations about why this, why that? How do you feel about, you know, the suicides? How do you feel? And, and have someone at the top highest levels answer the questions and they're not, they won't do that. It's all very controlled. And when you have people dying from your teachings, you shouldn't be about controlling what you're, presenting you should be about fixing the problem and that needs to start happening it's this weird toxic death of empathy yeah where in a weird twist a church that's named after jesus is like hardening people against empathy yeah yeah, yeah. weird yeah very weird yeah yeah, yeah like, the lord will change things in due time well how many lives are going to be at ruined between now and then. And that, I think that's, that makes a good segue for us to kind of maybe close off this episode and go to the third, because, you know, we, we are going to continue to want to have believing Mormons on Mormon stories and even progressive Mormons. We don't want to shame them. We don't want to right. talk bad about them. We don't want to like say that they're not doing courageous heroic work because we don't know. But at the same time, I remember like Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens and, and, you know, Richard Dawkins and others saying sometimes progressive Christians are the, are the, are the worst because they're enablers. In some ways they're the apologists and the enablers that allow for the ongoing pain and suffering. And I don't, I'm not saying I believe that. Yeah. I'm not saying that's true. The opposite might be true. They might be the ones saving lives but I can understand why someone might feel that way. Cause yeah. if you just are like, if, if you're like, if you're staying in, but you believe that it's wrong and you know, the church is killing people and you're staying in and you tell yourself that you're doing it because it'll change someday or you're going to help from within. How are you not constantly tormented at a severe level by the carnage you see all around you? Yeah. And how do you, if you pay tithing to it, if you give your name and your reputation to it, how do you survive? It's a really good question. I, I think there's only, because uh, <laughs> I thought about that a lot, because that was me for, we're going we're to get there. We're going right? there we're going right going now. There. <laughs> and uh, I think there are people who are doing it right now who are who are actually ac actually able to pull it off. Um, like one, one of them, I'll just do a quick shout out for, for Derek Knox. He's a gay Mormon convert to the church, but biblical theologian, amazing scriptorian, has a podcast where he talks about how it's wrong. I, uh, according to like the scriptures, if you re really interpret them in the, in the, you know, the way that they should be interpreted, if we believed our own stuff, gay marriage would be allowed, gay ceilings, would, uh, full equality would be in the church. And I think if you're able to be that type of, of progressive believer that is publicly speaking out about it and maybe not paying, like I, 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 I took the approach of not paying tithing, not doing a calling unless it was ministering to LGBTQ people, which I never, never was given that calling because they didn't have it. 
But unless, like, I, I drew the line and said, I, I'll be in this church so that I can be a voice from within, but I'm not going to perpetuate with my money or my time yeah. or my, I'm only going to be a voice. That's, I think, how you can pull it off. There's yeah. some other people like, you know, Stan Mitchell in the, in the evangelical Protestant realm. He's a former pastor of a church. He had a coming about, and now he's all about uh, having a church that's very progressive and that sort of thing. I think the the mission to change things from within can be can be done in a very effective way but you have to you have to be careful not to like what you're saying make build up the organization which is actually making things harder you don't want to be an enabler no you don't want exactly. to carry the water for the well, abusers you don't you know no you I, don't. I also think you have to recognize a lot of the ways that the churches and churches and its leadership have become kind of pharisaical because yes yeah the, the one, the other thing that really bothered me on the mission as financial secretary was, you know, this, how much Jesus emphasizes about spending money on the poor, right? And how much the church has and doesn't use to spend on the poor. And um, it's just, there's that. And, and beyond that, they use their money to back causes that actively go against you know, gay marriage, and they, they fight that tooth and nail wherever they can. And so it, it, it's like, you have to look at, at I, I look at Christ's condemnation of the Pharisees in the New Testament, and I apply those to the church leaders, and I don't think that they can realistically escape blame at this point. Um, and that's going to be my personal opinion, and I know that's harsh for a lot of people to hear, but that's that's honestly how I feel about it at this point, having studied it and having live through what I've lived through, where it's just like these people are the people that Christ was trying to warn us about. Um, and I don't think that this is what Christ's church would look like. And it would look so, it's not like something totally different. Um, and, you know, what that is, I think it is up to every single person to decide. So, yeah. Well, Weston, I just can't thank you enough for being willing to share your story so beautifully, so thoughtfully, so vulnerably. This is the type of thing that saves lives. And every like every cohort of Mormon Stories listeners has like a, a set of families or a set of stories that are transformative for them. Maybe you had some that were transformative for you all at one point or another. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, I remember listening to Mormon stories after coming out to my to my aunt because she recommended, oh, you should listen to this one episode of um, Clark. I forget what's his name. Uh, he was a Broadway. Clark, um, Clark Johnson. Yes. We'll put it in the show notes. It's yeah. one of my favorite. Yeah. He was in the Book of Mormon musical, yes. the original right. cast. Right. One of the best Mormon stories of all time. Yeah, and that one, I, I remember listening to that Mormon stories and and – just crying because I realized that I was going to have to go through the same journey that he kind of went through with being comfortable with himself. And now it feels rewarding to be on the other end of it and be able to produce something, um, you know, write about my experience and already have people tell me that it resonates with them and that um, it's helped them. So I'm just, I'm just grateful. And I feel lucky that I was one of the ones who made it. Um, Cause I know that there's, there was a lot of times where, you know, a couple of things could have gone differently and, and it wouldn't have been the case. So. Beautiful. Well, the book is this body of water, a memoir by Weston Smith. It's in the show notes, buy it, buy the book. Of course I've already promoted it, but I'll say it again. Evan wrote this book. I'll call it a gay love letter to the Mormon church. <laughs> uh, Evan Smith, gay Latter-day Saints crossroads. Two uh, important books by two brilliant men. Um, by Weston's first, though. And read, by that's more, more, his is better than mine, for sure. You can read yeah. his for free, too, online. Mine's for free on, yeah, gayldscrosswords.org. Gets free download. So Yeah. yeah. And uh, so thanks so much to both of you. Gerardo, how you doing? Doing great. How's, how's, how's part two? You happy with part two? Yeah, for sure. Mas o menos, C plus, B minus. What are you thinking? A plus. A plus? Yes. <laughs> All right. Good. Well, that's not bad. That's two A pluses then. Yeah. I mean, this family likes straight A's, so <laughs> so don't 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 give us your a, your typical A minus for part for part okay. three. Is that all right, Evan? Sounds good. Yeah. Fair so enough. I'll try. So get this: as amazing as these two parts have been, part three is going to stand toe to toe with the other two parts, because now we've got Weston coming home from his mission early. 
while Evan's serving in the stake presidency, big time, big shot, international corporate firm, lawyer, lots of connections. And how's this going to play out? And how it's going to play out is that uh, Evan starts having questions in the stake presidency and he takes him ultimately to two Mormon general authorities and he's willing to name names, not in a scandalous, yeah, no, no. defamatory uh, hit piece way, but just in like a transparency way yep. of like, this is how he resolved his, you know, tried to resolve his concerns. These are the conversations that he had. This is why the conversations weren't necessarily productive or fruitful. And then that'll leave us to where your family, where does your family go? What happens with your dear wife? Does she yeah. stay in the church? Does she leave? Does your family stay in the church? Do they leave? Are they still in? Do they resign? Where does all this end up? That's part three, and it's going to be uh, exciting. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. The pressure's on. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. All right. So thanks for joining us for part two of this epic episode. Um, again, shout out to your lovely, lovely wife, your lovely mom. Thanks. Yeah. Huge shout out to her. She's love you. Yeah. Love you, Cheryl. Love you, Cheryl. Got to meet you and your sister and your brother at least. And, uh, anyway, don't go anywhere. Uh, don't go anywhere. Come right back for part three of this amazing series with Evan and Weston Smith on Mormon stories podcast. Be good to each other. Be kind to each other. We'll see you on the flip side.